to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Best Pledge of Allegiance in a while. That was a very good that one. Was that was good. Nice one. Um, this meeting is being televised by Telford Telemedia. Is anyone else present that plans to record? Okay, great. Okay, welcome to this meeting of the School Committee. Um, we have a couple of presenters tonight, so we're going to get started right away. Uh, first item of business tonight is approval of our minutes from our meeting on October 15th. I make a motion to approve the regular meeting, regular meeting School Committee minutes from October 15th, 2019. Second. Okay, any comments, corrections? Okay, all in favor of approval? Aye. Aye. Okay, five zero. Um, record this, or are you going to get them off the tape? Should we? Still okay. Get off okay. The tape. Great. All right. Uh, I don't see our CHS representatives yet, so um, there's no school today. We we oh, so we worked them very very okay. hard today. We'll so. go on to good news then. We'll, we'll on to good news, and I'll be very brief. So um, today was professional development day. We had um, over 300 educators at Chumpsford High School with our elementary school teachers, and plus our. Um, regional professional development. We had world languages and business at Chelmsford High School. Um, we had all of our other educators at seven other sites within the Merrimack Valley region, so it was great. I want to thank um, our National Honor Society students for coming and helping out during the day at CHS to help teachers get to their places. I also want to thank the Parker Pride reps at Parker Middle School. We ran an ed camp for our teachers at, at Parker, and those, those students came in and you know, on their day off to help make sure our educators knew where they were going. Um, and then quickly, I just wanted to say that um, Bill Silver, who is our Director of Communication, Technology, and um, Information, he is now going to be on the Digital Learning Advisory Committee. He was appointed by um, the Commissioner of Education to be on that advisory committee. So he'll, his appointment starts in November of this month, this month here, and all the way to June 2022. So congratulations to him. To hear. Yep. Are you losing your voice? I am losing my voice. I, I, you know, I never thought I'd see this day. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my other good news. Uh -oh. I may not be able to talk by the end of this meeting. Why couldn't this be an MCAS meeting? Yeah, right? yeah I know. <laughs> I know. All right. Anybody else have any good news? You and my husband uh, are thrilled. Yes, the Table of Plenty, which once a week gives a meal to people in town, started a program. Uh, Mari McEwen, who founded Table of Plenty, had seen, I believe it was in Medway, that they send home about 30 packages of food with students every week, and they're going from school to school, and Mary Moriarty's overseeing that, and I believe they're into their second week of that. So. Very nice. That is a great program. Yeah, no. Any, Absolutely fantastic. We'll try to have Mary in at some other point and just kind of talk about the programs more, so. Okay, anybody else have any good news? I just had a couple of things. Uh, first of all, um, town meeting recently approved um, monies at the last town meeting for um, the completion of the Chelsea High School parking lot and also the South Road pro uh, roof project. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, Town Manager Cohen and the Select Board for uh, putting those articles forth and for the, the town meeting reps for, for supporting them. As well as the crosswalks. In the, cr oh, the crosswalks, that's true, in front of the schools, right. so the flashing crosswalks. So again, th you know, thank you to everybody for, for supporting the schools in that way. Uh, and the other thing is, is just to um, announced that we, we have reached a tentative agreement with the Chelmsford Federation of Teachers on a new contract. So hopefully they'll be meeting in the next couple of weeks to uh, ratify and uh, with any luck at our next meeting we'll be able to do the same. So it was good to, to work with them and to get that uh, taken care of uh, this early on in the, in the process. So that's my good news. Uh, hey, next we're up to public input. Uh, if anybody would like to speak to the committee about any of the items on tonight's agenda, please come forward and state your name and address. All right, then we are on to new business. We're on to new business, and first up this evening is um, one of our school and department presentations, so I'd like to invite up uh, Dr. McMahon from South Row Elementary School and Jason Romalo, the assistant principal of South Row, and John Morris, our department coordinator for science. I know they have a lot of friends with us, but you can introduce your friends tonight uh, to talk a little bit about some of the work that's taking place at South Row Elementary, <coughs> and then uh, obviously as it ties into our science uh, department there, as well as district-wide. So welcome, guys, and thank you very much for, uh, for coming tonight. Thanks for having us. Great. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, we have lots of friends behind us. They'll be coming up uh, slowly but surely, but uh, once again, just thank you for having us. We obviously, the district administration works really hard together, um, and so I know I can speak on behalf of the elementary administrative team that we really enjoy 
collaborating with all of the coordinators. We're lucky to have um, very skilled coordinators. Uh, we've chosen to combine with our science coordinator this year because um, as you heard last spring, we were just here in April. One of the projects that we were just starting up at that time was our um, courtyard uh, renovation looking at outdoor classroom space as well as um, a school garden. Um, so we're gonna kind of spend some time tonight on, on that project and how that's going. Um, so um, thank you for having us tonight. So again, I'm gonna start with some South Row news, go into the outdoor classroom work, and then um, John's gonna also kind of segue into um, some of the science curriculum across the district. So uh, a good teaching practice is always to connect um, previous knowledge that you've taught to new knowledge. So um, last year we were here twice uh, for South Row. Um, and um, one of the visits was an update on the STRIVE program, um, our social emotional program for the district, the elementary program. Um, and that continues to thrive. Um, in addition to that, we came for our regular spotlight. Um, and at that spotlight, we presented a bit on the science curriculum, a bit on our um, iReady initiative, a bit on our tier two. Um, we also had quite a few pilots last year. Uh, we piloted the breakfast program, which then carried out in all elementary schools. Um, the second step data that we were collecting last year, um, as well as we had piloted some learning walks. Um, so new teachers that had come into the district um, had come over to South Row to visit classrooms for classroom management techniques. Um, and so uh, those were kind of our focuses last year. We also highlighted a couple of events that we had never focused at school committee, uh, the International Festival and the Science Fair, and all of these things kind of continue to be a focus at South Row. Um, so just wanted to make that connection before we moved on to tonight's presentation. Um, and Mr. Ramal will tell you a little bit about our academic goals this year. Yes, so our academic goals are similar to last year, which is a good thing. I know last year we kind of uh, started to kind of roll out a few newer initiatives in the district, or at least um, continuation on that. So the one big piece um, for academic uh, in, is iReady and technology. Uh, technology is a big district-wide push this year, which is great. Um, this year we spend a lot of time with our staff, kind of getting them more comfortable with Google and the Google platform in the district, as well as kind of an overall staff site where teachers are able to kind of utilize a lot of the resources to, of course, and impact, um, make a positive impact for the kids. Uh, we also have seen an increase in Chromebook carts, which the kids love and the teachers love, uh, again, to make that connection with the blended learning piece. Um, so kids are very active with iReady and the Clever platform and a lot of pieces uh, with technology. Um, this year, we hope to also host our uh, parent discussion night uh, for our school council geared towards technology. Um, I know over at Biome they did a similar presentation last year and were very successful with parents kind of wanting to learn a little bit about X2 and just how they can work with iReady at home with their kids and even just in general some of the technology pieces um, uh, that we're using in the classroom and how they can kind of make that connection. So we're really excited about that coming up uh, in the area of technology and again it ties into that blended learning piece. Um, science, we're in our third uh, kit this year which is life science and I know um, Mr. Morris will probably go a little bit more into detail on that, but this is our final um, unit. Um, the kids love science um, and all the hands-on connections. Um, and one piece that we're working on this year is kind of blending the social studies and science kind of together um, and kind of um, allowing kids to kind of see those connections. Some unofficial goals that we kind of have uh, this year is one being just attendance in general. Um, attendance is now an accountability measure, um, of course, on the MCAS test, but also just to kind of communicate with families just so they kind of know where, um, where their children are at with how many days they are out to kind of encourage kids to kind of be in school and kind of utilizing vacations for the vacation week pieces. So uh, we're really kind of trying to kind of build those connections with families and just kind of keep it positive. And also if there's something that we need to know at the school level to help support families um, is something that we're really trying to push uh, this year. Um, as a school. Um, the collaboration of special ed and regular ed um, is always a piece that we kind of work together to kind of own all of our students and kind of work uh, to help them um, make educational gains. So we continue to work uh, and collaborate um, on that pieces. We've seen a rise in special ed needs, so we're going to continue our work uh, with collaboration there. Um, and lastly, Dr. McMahon mentioned that we did do learning walks for um, uh, newer teachers or teachers kind of in their first three years last year, which was extremely successful. This was kind of district-wide where we kind of piloted at South Row. But the biggest feedback we got from teachers in our building was we want to do it. Um, some of our uh, veteran teachers or teachers that have been around um, and just wanting to get in other um, educators' classrooms. And I know the one piece that I think I can echo 
um, with, uh, on behalf of Do Dr. McMahon as well, is we get to go in the, all the classrooms every day and we get to see all the creativity and all the amazing lessons that our teachers are, um, d um, are executing. So we want to kind of continue to give teachers the opportunity to see each other. So that's a big goal that we have this year. Um, so as Mr. Romello said, um, you know, our goals, I think it's a really positive thing that our goals have not changed um, drastically this year. Um, so you might remember over the last three years, a lot of my presentations have been focused on social emotional learning. That's been our district goal. Um, so we continue to work on our tier one and tier three to make sure that those are in place. Um, this year, our focus for our uh, school improvement plan goal is really, again, on tier two. Um, last year was a lot of pilots, a lot of testing out things that might work. And so this year, we're really kind of trying to fully implement and with fidelity. So I'll just kind of run back through uh, what these mean. Um, again, tier one is what we give all students. And so, um, you know, as a school, we teach second step to all students K through four for social skills. We also use the PBIS framework um, to make sure that there's expected behaviors throughout the building. Um, I think those go hand in hand. Um, you can have a student that doesn't understand behavioral expectations but has social skills or vice versa. You can have somebody that understands expectations but also doesn't have social skills. So both kind of have to be at play um, in a school. We also use our, our RRS tickets to reinforce those expectations around the building um, and that's been a very big success. And again, tier one is what we give to all of our students. Um, tier two kind of becomes that gray area, so sometimes that's delivered in the classroom, sometimes it's in an intervention group. Um, it can still be considered general education. Um, so this is our second year, so we're really looking to streamline the process. Our tier two team um, is really um, like a systems team. We're really trying to make sure we have systems in place that we can sustain. Um, so what we are did last year was we found a way to identify students that might need a little bit more. So for example, the whole group second step lesson isn't quite working, they need a little bit more. So we identified um, students through a screening process. Uh, we also tested out several different um, groups. Um, so for example, a motor group, maybe needing to get motor um, involved throughout the day. Uh, we also did a zones booster group, so really understanding what zone you're in. Um, we also have a check-in, check-out system. For, so for those students that really benefit from additional kind of adult connections, they check in the building with a, an adult that's not necessarily their classroom teacher and check out um, so that they have kind of that additional adult support. And this year, I think what we're really trying to focus on is the data collection piece and really following, is this actually successful? So at, last year was a lot of piloting and trial and error. So to be honest, we didn't keep fantastic data on the outcomes, and so that's really the goal of our team this year, is to now that, now that we feel like we've found interventions that work and systems that can work in our school, um, we really want to make sure we're collecting the proper data. Um, and again, just the implementation being consistent. So last year we ran one like eight week session and this year we hope to at least get two in um, throughout the school year, if not three. Um, in addition to that, um, I think um, as a district, we obviously have always had academic goals as well as social emotional goals. And I think one of the pieces that we're at uh, at South Row is really at this point kind of blending those two things. They're not separate. Um, and we've known that from the start, but really kind of bringing that back together. Um, so we had a professional development in um, the fall uh, that was fantastic. Uh, School Moves is a company out of Washington, um, and the owner of it, um, Skyped in basically to us and did a PD and she really looked at some academic interventions as well as social emotional that could affect um, kids in both ways, right? So it's incorporating movement and quick calming activities that then gain you time back for instruction. Um, so she's a reading specialist um, by trade, um, but then worked a lot with like OTs and PTs on how do you, as a staff, how do you make sure that you're meeting all kids' needs in the best way possible? And again, working smarter, um, not harder. Um, so it was a really well-received uh, um, PD that we had run. Um, again, tier three is really um, kind of the, that higher need of support, um, and we work on that. You know, we obviously have the social emotional program at South Row, but obviously we can have students that come to South Row that aren't identified yet um, or are working on that. And so, again, we um, are really working to make sure that we have um, consistent plans in place, um, BCBA involvement, or again, they may need the STRIVE program. Um, so again, we've just kind of been really working on honing in kind of the levels of supports that we have in the building for social emotional. Um, so now we're going to transition in um, to kind of a, the focus of tonight on our courtyard. 
Um, I think, again, this is a really neat connection um, at this point to academics, to social emotional, to healthy living, to educating a whole child. Um, our courtyard space um, is absolutely beautiful, and uh, we've spent a lot of time over the last six months making it even better and more usable. And so um, we do want to tell you a little bit about how classrooms are using it, and then we're going to talk a little bit about our enrichment program that's going on with gardening, and then a little bit more about what a school garden might look like. Um, so we're going to start, actually, by having uh, Mrs. Connolly come up. Uh, Mrs. Connolly is a second grade, long-time second grade teacher at South Row. Long time. <laughs> <laughs> See how she threw that in there? Say that. Molly. <laughs> veteran teacher. Very veteran. Um, and well um, she is, uh, we asked Mrs. Connolly to come because she really uh, just uses the courtyard in so many positive ways. Uh, we have a lot of people using the courtyard in many different ways, uh, but she really has um, taken to it. So she brought back um, two of her students with her as well, and they're actually now third graders, but they got to experience the courtyard last year with Mrs. Connolly mm -hmm. through both science and read alouds and things. So she's going to tell you a little bit about how she utilizes our courtyard. Thank you. Well, nice to be here. Good, good evening, everybody. Um, South Rose Courtyard is generally simply a gem. It truly is. I'm fortunate that my classroom overlooks the, um, the courtyard. You guys can attest to this, right? Um, <laughs> the students and I have the opportunity to view the beauty of nature each and every day um, through the four seasons. And there's nothing quite as magical as that first snowstorm or first snow over the um, courtyard. I'm just hoping it's not going to come Friday. It's a little too <laughs> soon, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's not. No, I'm not rushing it. Um, the courtyard has been utilized in many ways. One of the ways that we use, um, and John will attest to this, when we do our science unit, our butterfly unit, at the end we always release the butterflies out in the courtyard, and it's just, it's just magical. And then to be able to see them, some of them that do stay right outside our window, it's pretty cool. Um, our co my colleagues and I have also been using the courtyard this year for our new social studies unit, um, which is mapping. So the children will go out and they will create a map of the courtyard along with a map key to identify what is in the um, courtyard. And my favorite use, and you guys can attest to this as well, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's my class this year, mm -hmm. um, we go out almost every day as long as the weather is good and we go out and I do a read aloud and thanks to um, the PTO for refurbishing that bench because it w didn't look quite like that before and now it's just a beautiful beautiful place to go out and to do read aloud. Okay. So now we're going to hear from um, Addie, a third grader, and she's going to tell you a little bit about her experience in the courtyard. Hi, my name is Addie Lebensky and I'm in third grade in Miss Sanborn's class. I was in Miss Conley's class last year in second grade. When we went outside with Mrs. Conley, we did a science experiment. We poured water and watched where it would go to learn more about liquids and solids. We also poured sand and had to see where it went. We got butterflies as babies, and when they were adults, we let them go. Most flew away, but some stayed. One even stayed attached to Miss Morin. <laughs> Miss, Miss, Mrs. Brennan makes and fills bird feeders so that lots of different birds come by our courtyard. I like to be in the courtyard because I like to hear the birds tweeting. It is really calming. And next we're going to hear from Mikey, a third grader who was also in Mrs. Connolly's class last year. Hi, my name is Mikey Hopkins. Mikey. I'm in third grade in Mrs. Vasquez's class. Last year I was in Mrs. Connolly's class in second grade. This is what I like about the courtyard. I like how the bench is newly painted over. The, I like all the picnic tables. In Mrs. Connolly's class last year, we did le read it out out there. I like how many trees there are. The flower beds are all cleaned out, and the garden group that I am in after school planted new plants. With the after school garden group, we started a pollinating garden so bees and butterflies will come in. What I hope we can add are umbrellas to, to the picnic tables so when we are out there, we have shade. I hope we can get all new soil for the raised bed and plant more vegetables and fruit. The courtyard makes me feel happy and I like the fresh air. Thank you for your time. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna actually go to the next slide and then um, we'll have another group come up in just a second. 
Um, so as you heard uh, from the testimonies of our students and staff, um, it's really just a nice intersection of having our curriculum meet, you know, again, healthy living, environment, understanding um, healthy living and, and appreciating the environment. And um, it's just been a really nice addition um, to the space in our building as well. It's also obviously a safe place. It's in the middle of our building. And so um, it's just a really nice um, space in the middle of our building to utilize and to have more classes out there. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, so again, there's a lot of uh, connections that we can make to the science curriculum. Um, I, we've also been trying to apply for some grants. Um, and so one of the grants you're going to hear from uh, Megan Curran, who's been heading up uh, this committee, our garden committee, or outdoor classroom space committee. And um, she's really taken the, um, the, the view that if we can really teach students to be environmental stewards um, and really understand how to take care of the environment and where their food comes from, it can really kind of just benefit students. Um, so the benefits of a school garden are just um, innumerable. They also really um, connect so many different curriculums. So you heard obviously how one classroom teacher uses um, that space and obviously all the grades have different science curriculum they can connect it to. Um, but in addition to that, I know our art teacher has even taken groups out there for different projects. They've been sketching the environment. Um, they've also gone out there just um, to do plaster um, because it's messy. Um, so everyone's just sort of taking advantage of the beautiful space. Um, so uh, we'll go to the next slide. We're going to have another group come up, and then I'm, after that, I will also let you know a little bit about what we've done so far and what we're going to be doing next. Um, so we'll have uh, Megan Kern come up, and she's got three friends from her um, after-school club. Um, Mikey is also in her after-school club, but he wanted to speak um, about his second grade experience as well. That's an amazing job. <laughs> Very impressive. <laughs> so this is Megan Kern. She's a parent at South Row, and she's been heading up um, this committee, and really um, she's the, the brains behind, behind the operation. <laughs> sure. Thank you guys so much for having us and letting us talk about um, this exciting project at South Row. And I just have to thank Dr. McMahon and John Morris and Ms. Romalo for kind of embracing my crazy passion for this and um, allowing me to sort of go forward with this. Um, I grew up in Chelmsford. My husband grew up in Chelmsford. Um, now we're raising our three children in Chelmsford, so we're officially townies. Um, I love South Row. I love it. I think the teachers are amazing. The, the um, administration is amazing. And I have been so excited to see the passion and the excitement in the kids um, when I talk about gardening. I'm a nutritionist. Um, I teach um, farm to table cooking at a farm. And my favorite thing is to see a child pull a carrot out of the ground and say, I can eat this? Like, yes, you can eat that. And they love it, and they say, this tastes so good, I can just really taste it. Um, and they want to know more, and they want to grow more, and they want to get their hands dirty. And um, I feel like this garden could be huge. I, I think this could really be something. Um, there are some facts I just wanted to go over. Um, there's only 2% of children who actually eat enough fruits and vegetables, and that is really depressing. Um, that's un especially since the food that we're growing today is less nutritious. Um, as a result of the way it's grown um, and the agriculture that we have in this country. Um, research shows that children who participate in growing food are more likely to eat fruits and veggies and be more knowledgeable about nutrition. Um, this is really important um, in preventing the you know, chronic diseases that are related to diet, such as diabetes and heart disease um, and obesity that is running rampant in our country. Um, school garden programs not only promote healthy um, lifestyles in children, but have been shown to also improve children's behavior and performances at school and improve their attitudes and appreciation for the environment. Um, my daughter Kaylee um, <laughs> can attest to the fact that we talk about how much sugar is in food um, and how that can you know, wreak havoc on your brain that's trying to do all this hard work at school and your energy levels and how when we fuel our body with the good food, um, how much better we feel and how much more energy we have for the fun things that we want to do um, and for all the hard work that we're going to do at school. Um, participation in a school garden teaches responsibility towards the student's community and helps develop stewards for the planet and the future generations, which is something Dr. McMahon talked about. Um, these are our future policymakers and voters, and I think if we can get them connected at a deeper level to nature and the environment, um, these will be habits that are sort of instilled in them and something that they will take to the polls and really realize that this is, this is important. 
Um, in the garden, students will be able to connect more with nature and learn to work as a group towards a common goal. Um, the enrichment program I teach after school, it's so cute to see the kids get together um, and planting bulbs and um, cleaning out the, the raised beds that we have and just being, you know, handing each other the watering can for their turn and working together and saying, I can't wait to eat this food. And it's just, it's just wonderful. Um, also, they'll be combining the math and science curriculum in the garden whether we work on their math and science skills. Um, and finally, research shows that a school garden can also improve a student's social and emotional well-being, which, you know, today with social media and, um, you know, technology, that's wonderful, but it's also kids are just not connecting the way they used to. Um, depression, anxiety are all things that are just kids. We are dealing with this every day, more so than when we were growing up. Um, and just being in nature, I think, has a calming effect. It just slows everybody down. Um, there's no phones in the garden there's no electronics it's just the sounds of nature and kids just getting their hands dirty and they they love it um, so we have some wonderful friends who are going to tell us what they love about the garden so this is um Kaylee, go ahead. hi I'm Kaylee and I'm in fourth grade and the and this is why I love the garden and how I feel when I am in the garden first I love the garden because I love to grow the food and eat it I love to make salad it with it and other foods. I also like to chop the food we grow. Next, I feel happy when I am gardening and it takes all the stress out of me. It's so peaceful and brings back a lot of happy memories. That's why I love the garden. This. Hi, my name is Carly Maxwell and I'm a fourth grade student at South Row. I'm here tonight to tell you why I think the garden at South Row is a great idea. The students at South Row have been planting vegetables like peppers, tomatoes, and onions. It has been so fun to learn how to plant and grow these vegetables. The students were able to use these vegetables to make yummy food like salsa and guacamole. I also think the garden is, has been a good idea because we learn about eating health, healthy, making better food choices, and teaching responsibility. All the students love the garden and it is an it is a great use for our courtyard space. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lynette Grab, and I am a student in the fourth grade from South Row School. I'm here with you tonight to talk about South Row's courtyard garden. I'm really excited that South Row finally has a school garden. I especially enjoy go growing foods like fruits and vegetables. After I grow them, it makes me feel so good when I think about the difference I made. I love growing foods myself because when you eat something you just grew, you realize just how fresh it really is, especially when compared to store-bought foods. We were thinking about the possibilities of the food from the garden, and one idea that came up was using the fresh fruits and vegetables for our school lunches. I'm sure many students would enjoy even broccoli much more if it were fresh from the garden. Us Farm Fresh members are thrilled to be tending to such an amazing garden. I hope this garden will continue for many years for the sake of all. The wonderful present and future students of South Row, although I do admit that I wish some of the older past South Row students had gotten to have such a wonderful opportunity. Once again, I am so thrilled that this dream has finally become a reality. I can't to wait to see what this garden has in store for us all. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to Megan and the students. A couple of uh, our fourth graders are also on our uh, student council, and so the student council is also in great support of this yes. courtyard and what they can do with it next, and especially the garden. So um, those are some really nice testimonies to this. Um, so <coughs> what we've uh, done so far, so we started this project last April um, with a set of volunteers. You can see up in the top right of uh, people just trying to clean out the garden. Um, we also had the correctional facility come over the summer and they did quite a bit of work for us out there. Um, facilities was also very supportive um, in terms of taking down some old stumps and things. Um, and so you can see from these pictures, um, and I hope and invite you all to come take a tour. Uh, it's just a beautiful space at this point. Uh, very cleaned up. Um, so what we've done so far is we've added a ramp for accessibility so that all students can get to the courtyard. Um, we've also removed the excess trees and bushes um, so it's a real more open space. We've grown some more grass. Um, we've cleaned out all of the beds um, that are currently there. 
Uh, we've power washed all of the walkways and put weed removal down so that the walkways are clear. Uh, we've restored the white bench and the picnic tables. We've added the raised beds, um, which has also been a really nice thing for the, especially the after school gardening um, group. Um, and we've also had clipboards donated, four rain barrels donated, um, and um, it's just been a really nice success. Uh, we also received our first grant, so we applied for three so far, um, and we did receive one from the Mass Agricultural in the Classroom grant. Um, so we've got um, $270 to spend. We're hoping to add a shade tent. Um, actually, we'll go to the next slide, because I think that's on the next one. Um, some of the things that we want to do next with some of the money, um, again, we're going to establish the growth of the um, plants and vegetables, plant food in the raised beds, and I have um, spoken with Nancy Antolini. She'd be very happy to incorporate anything that we grow um, into our food lunches, which would be amazing for the kids to see um, literally the fruits of their labor. Um, and um, we're going to add a shade tent um, for some seating on the grass, uh, solar lights uh, for learning, um, and again, the Enrichment Garden Group is going to continue to work. Our fourth graders, um, we have four rain barrels, so each class is going to get a chance to do a mural on a rain barrel so that they can kind of leave a mark um, there. Um, we're going to be obtaining hopefully one more bench. Uh, we've got three seated benches so that if a class wants to go out and do work, they have a tabletop to do their work on. Um, as you heard from Mikey, we're starting to add a pollinating garden so that we can attract butterflies and bees. And um, we're also hoping to add an outdoor storage container to keep all of our supplies. And uh, we're even thinking long term, maybe a small greenhouse so that we could grow even more. Um, but that's down the road a little bit. So. Um, so just some final thoughts. Again, I think this goes along with our environmental stewards and this connection between our science curriculum, but also um, being you know, citizens and understanding the environment, where your food comes from, et cetera. It's just some final thoughts. Uh, again, unless, you, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not by Dr. Seuss. And then Max Licato, a children's uh, book author, says no one can do everything, but everyone can do something. Um, and so we're hoping to instill some of those values in the students with this project. Um, with that said, we'll make a connection right to our science curriculum. Awesome. Thank you, you very much. That was a lot of information. That's <coughs> it's a phenomenal yes, highlight of what. Yes, questions. Oh, do you want to ask a question before we move on? Yeah. Yes. Is that oh, we asked you a couple <coughs> questions. Sorry. Um, so first of all, congratulations um, to you, your staff, and students and parents on just a terrific uh, courtyard rehabilitation. Um, it looks fantastic, and you should all be very proud. Um, it's wonderful to see these kids have the opportunity to be able to do um, some learning you know, outside and make all of these connections to uh, uh, physical activity, um, emotional health, nutrition. Um, my question is, um, is there going to be opportunities, when you talk about environmental stewards, mm -hmm. and this is something that I think the town of Chelmsford is very, very passionate about. We have a very active um, open space stewards, the Chelmsford Land Trust. Are we thinking about making any types of connections um, to those groups, maybe going and touring the community gardens and the greenhouses or uh, the maple tree uh, farm that we have in town? Yeah, we have discussed that, um, reaching out to them. We haven't gotten there yet. We were kind of in our opening stages, but we have discussed as a group, the garden committee, um, reaching out to some of the resources. I know we've also discussed there's so many farms in towns that we could reach out to and see what opportunities we have there as well. Um, so that is something that we've discussed at length. Great. We also have, I'm going to say, at least four uh, garden clubs, I think, in town yep. as well yep. um, that, uh, you know, maybe a wealth of uh, information as well. So yeah. A great um, idea. Yeah, and I think that you know they've got such a great start at South Road. This would be great to see how, to help them see how it translates into uh, the community that they live in. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for all of that. Anybody else before we move on? I wanted to go back to another part of your present. First of all, I agree with all this on the garden. I was raised on a farm, so great. <laughs> at that time it was labor, <laughs> and this is you know, <laughs> <laughs> right? but at that time it was actually feeding the hundred chickens and so on. So quite different. Uh, but what I wanted to, um, and the percentage of people who grow up on farms is very small, so I think that this is quite important. What I did want to ask you about is the special needs. You said that. Um, Special education needs are increasing. How you're seeing different? Can you go a little more in depth into that? Yeah. Um, back in as part of tier two, 
yeah, or when you talked about as part your, of the academic in your presentation, goals. you said that you are seeing more uh, special education yeah, needs. Yeah, goal, of the collaboration yeah. piece. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I think across the board, <coughs> we just have a lot of different um, disabilities that are coming to the schools, um, whether that's um, academic or social emotional, um, physical, uh, medical, et cetera. Um, and so um, we are trying to find the best ways to support all students. Um, so, you know, again, the collaboration between general ed and special ed is, has always been there, um, but really just making sure that we are um, having schedules um, kind of work together, really making sure we're giving every student what they need um, and mm -hmm. just continuing to look at that. Um, I think um, especially with a lot of the technology that is coming out and, and that can be a resource, but it can also be a challenge for some students. So um, kind of looking at that together as a team. Okay, thank you. Yeah. It's really great. The garden thing <coughs> is a wonderful thing. Thank you. You know, Dennis, before we jump into the science part, and one, one thing we didn't mention under good news was the uh, phenomenal presentation at town meeting uh, by the high school students on the, that on the yes, on the uh, the Warren article regarding plastic bags. They were really unbelievable, terrific. So much great feedback from so many people about how well spoken and articulate they were. So I, I forgot to mention that under good news, but I think it is right. worth saying. That so. blends right back into science. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, one of the biggest things I, I want to point out with this is that th this is just one of the, what we hope is one of just tons of different new things that we have that we could add on or show examples with our science curriculum. Uh, we hope that this is the, the first of many spaces that we can utilize with outside our typical four walls and a ceiling uh, that we've had for a while. Um, just to further look at what's happening in our elementary schools, um, first major update with our FOSS curriculum, there's a new software element called FOSS Map. And that FOSS map is actually an assessment software that comes with our FOSS curriculum. And right now it's only with grades three and four at the elementary level. They don't have it for K to two. What's really great about this though is it allows us to get a snapshot of how our kids are doing strictly based on the standards. So if a teacher uses this online assessment tool, we can actually get a report out and it puts our students essentially into different areas if they're exceeding those standards, meeting those standards, uh, if they're approaching them, or if they just need extra support uh, to move up in levels. Uh, currently, we have a few teachers who are using this because it is emerging software from FOSS, so there's some bugs that are working out on their end, also on our end, on how the suite talks to each other. Uh, but so far, the initial feedback from the staff of when it's working and how they get it, instant feedback and the kids get the instant feedback, it's a phenomenal resource. Uh, this past summer, we were lucky enough to continue some of our pacing guide work and our ECOs work in grades, uh, grades K to 4 uh, with the building administration and then also Dr. Bay Ranavan, Stephanie Quinn, Kelly Rogers, sitting down to look at how are we going to fit all this in and what does this look like in, in a whole school year uh, because we have to roll out this third science unit to meet our new science frameworks. Um, but having everyone together to look at this pacing guide and say, what does this mean for our schedules? What does this mean for how we organize the calendar? What does this mean for you know, how we look at our entire day? Which was, it was a great process. Uh, these pacing guides are also digital. A lot of teachers like to print them out to reference them, but having that digital Google Doc piece, we have some teachers who will look at it and say, well, wait a minute, we noticed this investigation could only happen in a couple days versus three. So they can actually put a comment on the doc or they might say, we need to order more supplies, and that can go on. So as we look at this document next year, we have that instant feedback to help us plan more effectively. Um, and as you heard, we have the life science rollout uh, from kindergarten up to grade four. And you can kind of see how the language spirals up with this. Uh, with our kindergartners, we start with our animals two by two unit, and we move into plants and animals. Uh, from there with grade two is insects and plants, and I'll hit a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, structures of life and environments. All told, there's a lot of supplies that go with these. So in our elementary schools this year, you'll see earthworms, redworms, uh, guppies, goldfish, crayfish, butterflies, silkworms. It's gonna be one big happy fun place. Mm -hmm. So. They have their own refrigerator yeah. out in the pods. Mm. Yes, we have our own separate <laughs> refrigerator that's only science. <laughs> Nothing else goes in there, that's the plan. Next slide, please. <laughs> Uh, so just to talk a little bit more about what's happening in grade two. For years, uh, we've had this butterfly unit, and I remember when I first came on, it was so great to go in, and I remember the first class I ever went in, kids would literally come up, they say, we're growing a butterfly. Like the amount of ownership that a kid has when they take this on and they watch it grow, and, and to see them release it out you know, into the environment, it's, they really feel that ownership of I helped make this happen. Uh, with our new insects and plants kit, we still use these same butterflies, but now students get a little bit deeper exposure of what do they rely on? What do they interact with in their environment? So 
using the schoolyard is another huge part of this. And I know New England weather doesn't always cooperate. You know, somebody talked about Snow Friday. We'll see what happens. Um, but with this investigation, they can really focus on what do these life cycles look like? What is actually happening to these insects in real time? And they're also able to look at those structures. And when you look at those structures and you look at different species, even our youngest learners, they're figuring out patterns. They are looking at several different species, what they're consisted of, and they're saying, wait a minute, I notice this is what's happening. Well, I notice with this insect, this is happening instead. And they can have conversations on that. And that leads into how do these relationships interact? And a courtyard and an outdoor garden is a perfect place for this. And even, you know, maybe down the road we talked about having that greenhouse, you can see this throughout the winter as well. How is everything working together? What are these relationships with the different species? Uh, and even long term, if we look at what does this look like with seed dispersal, which there's a lot more research coming in the educational world of how that works with outdoor spaces. So I'm interested to see where that lens as well. Uh, moving into our middle schools, uh, our large focus is meeting these you know, continued demands of the 2016 frameworks. Uh, continuing what we did with K-4 to with our pacing guide work, we we're lucky enough this summer where we uh, had pacing guide revisions and creations in grades 5, 6, 7, and 8. Uh, more than 70% of our science teachers in these grades got together and we were able to have a concise pacing guide at each grade level. So it's not just a matter of looking at classroom to classroom, we're also looking at school to school where our kids are having those similar experiences and those kids are looking at the same types of investigations and the same types of assessments going forward. Similar to what we did the elementary, they're digital versions. So teachers are already saying, hey, you know, we need to make sure we order the cockroaches for grade six by November 5th. So they can put that little, you know, edit on the document. Uh, or we also have so many different elements we have to get from like a Hannaford or market basket. So that's all shared on there. And it helps me because now I can actually look at this from an inventory perspective and a pricing perspective of how much does this all cost and how can I do this in a smarter way. Uh, similar to what we had with three and four with FOSS map, we have grade five and six teachers who are emerging in this work. Had a phenomenal conversation with uh, some fifth and sixth grade teachers today with this. And for them to look at this software and say, on every assessment, I can see where my kids are in relation to a standard. That's a powerful thing. So for us to be able to do this and look at this throughout the term and throughout the year, it's a phenomenal amount of data that we can also funnel up into grade seven and even to grade eight later on. And last but not least with our middle schools, the science assessment or the science technology engineering assessment for MCAS in grade five and eight it was new data uh, protocols this year. It was a whole new analysis system from the state. Part of that means we also have to look at our assessment strategies. So when we look at our assessment strategies, the old, here's a multiple choice and go there, and this, here's a whole open response. It's starting to shift away from that. So how are our students looking at nonfiction text? How are they looking at data sources? How are they looking at graphs? What does this all mean for an entire cohort of problems? Our staff have to look at that too and have to be able to help our students with that. So with this assessment, it's not your typical quote unquote test that we look at. We look at a variety of different means to do this. And I'm lucky enough too to have an eighth grade teacher, Ms. Bonner, who's on the assessment development committee for DESE. So I get information from the state. She gets information from the state. So we can come back together. We can meet and say, this is where things are going. So when we design our assessments and we look at the system for it, we have a much clearer picture for it. And then up at Chelmsford High School, uh, our pacing guide work, here we go. We went up into grades nine and 10 as well. Uh, we piloted and then adopted uh, Pearson's Miller and Bean for biology. And this summer with the majority of the biology teachers, we were able to come up with the pacing guide and syllabus for this. We have all of our labs laid out for the entire year, which is a huge resource, not only from a financial piece to schedule out what we have, but also consolidate. What are the most effective labs for the, for the students to do? Uh, we were also able to add an additional dual enrollment course. Last year we had biotechnology, we added chemistry this year. And we're entertaining a variety of different options of other things that we could add with this. Uh, going very well, we have, I forget the exact number of students who signed up, but the number did increase over the last couple weeks. And then I wanted to wrap up talking about some updates with science, uh, with some new course offerings and updates with our high school courses. We added, uh, Biotechnology 1 was so popular, we added Biotechnology 2, which was an honors level course. I'll hit about that in a second. AP Physics C uh, is a new course which replaced AP Physics 2. And I have some students who will be coming up to tell us all about that. And some different updates with our industrial arts courses. So Biotechnology 2, this was something that really created uh, on its own, where our students were looking for that next level. They had an interest in biotechnology after they took the course. Uh, very, very lucky to have Ms. Kelly, uh, the teacher of this course. And this is everything that she was able to share with me. And I think this is very powerful for what they're able to do where in this class, you know, this is, if we look at this, they're starting by creating their own competent cells. 
by the end of the, and this is the work they've done so far. This is not an entire year plan. This has been done by mid-October, where they're moving through this work in Biotech 2, where they're, out, they're purifying their own proteins, they're assessing how stable it is, and then they're taking their findings, and Ms. Kelly is able to model how that presentation is from a biochemistry graduate student. I'm not assessing them like a graduate student, don't get me wrong, but for them to actually see what this looks like in that environment and then be able to have this happen in a high school classroom and see these huge three by five posters go up in the walls in the science wing, now every other student is starting to see the type of work that's going on. So it's, it's been a phenomenal addition and the kids are totally immersed in the work that they do with it. And then in AP Physics C, if I'd like to have my students come on up who will introduce themselves and talk a little bit about uh, this class briefly for us. While they come on up, I'll be able to. Uh, Do you want us to move? It doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> Musical chairs. Musical chairs, yes. Uh, so, just in general, uh, this course was a transition where we eliminated AP Physics 2 and we went to this calculus based AP Physics course. Uh, and I feel like it's very important to have some students here to talk about what the course is and some of the work they've done. And I'll have them introduce themselves and talk a little bit about the class. Uh, my name is Matt Waterman. I'm a, obviously a senior at Chelmsford High School taking AP Physics C. Um, I think the course is uh, very valuable um, just because of the calculus integration and uh, really using what we learn in math at a more advanced level than we've ever done before. Uh, last year I took AP Physics 2, uh, which used algebra. But as I was getting to the more advanced math, uh, it just wasn't reflected in my physics course as much. And this year, I feel that I have a very um, rigorous and advanced level physics course right alongside my math course, which uh, I believe imp has improved my skills and uh, ability to think about both together. Um, yeah. So I also took physics too, and I think from a practical standpoint, even as currently I'm applying to colleges and I'm looking at what AP credits are accepted, it's definitely AP Physics C is much more applicable to my future moving forward as somebody that plans to go into the STEM field. And also just looking at the, um, the application through different labs that we've done, this course has definitely been very lab heavy, which I think is going to translate very well into kind of a future of the real world experience. Like we recently did the rocket analysis lab, which um, you can see our data that we collected from that. And that was a very kind of hands off lab from the perspective of Ms. Hubbard. She let us experiment with which techniques worked best. And we had to design kind of our own procedure as a class as to how we were gonna get the data that she wanted. And I think that that was really reflective of, I guess, the real world experience with somebody tells you what they want their end product to be rather than tells you how to get to that end product. Um, so yeah, I think that the labs really supplement the material very well and it has just been a really great learning experience in that way. Hello, I'm Samiksha Sharma and I'm part of the same class, Physics C. And people often say that, how hard could it be? It's not rocket science, right? <laughs> but the stuff we do in this class is leading up to that. So my point would be that it's not easy, but it's simply worth it. The best part that I like about the class is that we collaborate a lot. We collaborate not in small groups, but as a class. And what that prompts us to do is figure out what we need, to, what we need as our data, how we want to get that, and to troubleshoot along the way. And then be able to take that data and be able to use concepts from calculus and from physics and combine them and see direct application of those which I think is hard to do when you're sitting listening to a teacher and is more useful when you get up and start figuring how to make things work and how to derive that data and how to process it, which has overall been very helpful because it, in, it really improves your ability to think and be critical about how your data is modeled and also to connect concepts that, is, um, that encompasses both physics and math which, as we all know, aren't very easy subjects to deal with. But at the end, it's all very fun, and it's all very collaborative and a helpful environment. So I think I've really benefited from the class. 
And I will say, I was able to go out with them when they did their rocket launch, and we recovered all but one rocket. <laughs> <laughs> it's a story for another day. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then on our last slide, uh, with an update in our industrial arts classes, uh, we added, we we're lucky enough to add uh, through some funding an additional CNC machine, uh, which gives us a lot more opportunities for our students to look at not just the equipment they can use in a wood shop, but also the digital piece. Uh, we were also able to purchase a photonic 7 watt laser, which means we can look at how we not just carve, but also engrave or create something that's a little bit. Um, a little bit more unique, and because I was the one who brought special things last year, I brought plants. Mm. I'm the one who always comes bearing gifts. So <laughs> just to show a little bit of the work for our five elected school committee members, this is actually a project, uh, project done by Adam Post, and this is a nice example of what they've done in this course, uh, where this is a combination, and this is, you can pass on, these are coasters that the students made. So you have your equipment where you can plane a piece of wood, you can cut a piece of wood, but now the students are going into the software side. Our students are learning how to program a CNC machine, create a pretty perfect circle, which is going to look okay. unique. But then they're also going to go back, smooth this out again, and they're going to look at another piece of software, and they're going to learn how can we take any image we want and put it onto any piece we want of, uh, of wood. Uh, we actually gave out a couple um, things today with uh, some cutting boards for some folks. And it's just great to see all of this come together with what the students are doing. So it's not just your traditional wood shop, it's now we have all this technical piece goes in, and if you look at your, um, look at industry outside us, you know, in our quote unquote real world applications, it's a phenomenal skill for these students to learn. Uh, and last but not least with uh, industrial arts, we've also transitioned from Vectorwork software, and we're going into our Autodesk suite and our um, architectural courses, so they're using Revit, which is an industrial standard with architectural design. Autodesk Suite is also the same thing used in our Project Lead the Way and engineering courses as well. So that our students are going into one suite to another and it merges well. So to wrap things up, what's coming up next? Uh, new biology assessment, computer-based coming up for MCAS this year. Uh, that's also going to be a new data analysis protocol. The state has not decided on it yet. They'll do that in August, so we have to see what that gives us. Uh, continue to look at what are our best options for dual enrollment with our students. Uh, also looking at what does science look like across the curriculum. I'm very fortunate to work with a phenomenal administration team. Uh, I can honestly say I've worked a ton with every other coordinator this year, not just in our content areas, but other, you know, troubleshooting, problem solving, etc. So how does science actually live throughout other content areas? One other thing that does come up, and this is something that's true in a lot of districts, is how does literacy skills uh, looked at in our science? And it's not just science literacy. We have to look at science literacy as literacy uh, to really look at our student development. And of course, with the district's one-to-one -one initiative, how do we effectively integrate this? How do we manage this in a way that our uh, students are getting the best learning possible? And okay. appreciate your time. Any okay, questions? So questions? Yeah. yeah. So my first comment is I didn't bring my plant, but I spoke to it this morning, and it said it liked its light okay. exactly where it was, and I couldn't move it. That's okay. Okay. I didn't see them out here, well, so it's okay. We'll let that really slide. Growing, so I want you to know that this is absolutely <laughs> wonderful. So I'd like you to know that you've now combined gardening, where I grew up in a farm, with my father's favorite uh, thing that he ever did in his life, which was woodwork. Perfect. And this is absolutely amazing what they can do today. I am so glad to see more engineering coming into the picture in your curriculum. Uh, I think that that's one of the requirements that we have to meet mm -hmm. uh, according to the state standards. Uh, happy, very happy to see this. Wonder if you would mind breaking down for me what exactly what what are the physics courses we're offering now at the high school level? This was an amazing presentation. I think it came uh, full speed from full circle from the kids in the garden to the kids in the classroom applying everything they've learned along the way, including in their coursework. It's just this was great to see. What how does that physics and all that learning translate when they leave our school? How prepared are they? So what are the courses that we're offering in the physics world? So currently the physics courses at Chumstead High, we have uh, Physics 3, mm -hmm. Physics H2, Honors Physics, AP Physics 1, and AP Physics C. And are we finding that, um, do we know the percentages of students who take the AP Physics and actually then take the exam? Yes, and it, it, I will say it does vary year to year because our enrollment in the course has uh, changed year to year. This year we have just over 50 students enrolled in AP1 and around 20 students in APC. 
I don't have the numbers on the signups for this year's test yet because that just wrapped up and I've not got that uh, from Mr. Vitale. Uh, I would say that one big thing that's happening nationally is what to do with AP Physics 1 because of how colleges look at it. So this is something I'm trying to stay on top of. of yes. Is it something that not only is, it's a very rigorous and beneficial class for our students, don't get me wrong, but as we take it, what's that benefit for beyond Chelmsford High? Yes. So looking at College Board, looking at what the local universities are doing, where our students mostly go, how does this impact them? Because at the end of the day, if there's another course that can give a better impact beyond yes. here, that's what I'd like to pivot towards. I'm glad you're addressing that. Thank you. Other questions? No, I just want to say that uh, I think that um, you've put together a terrific uh, program, top to bottom. Um, it's very impressive. Um, and I'm glad that, uh, that you're receiving the support from the administration that's necessary to be able to carry out these things in each of the buildings. I'd really like to give a shout out to the teachers, though, mm -hmm. because um, the last um, couple of times that we've had a chance to hear from students, they have been incredibly articulate um, in terms of uh, the subject matter. Um, as well as understanding what it is that they're learning and what the overall go goal of the course is. Yeah. And that's, that's really hard, you know, to, to, for sometimes for kids to be able to articulate, to really be able to pull all three pieces together. And so the fact that they can do that and they can do it so well um, is a real testament to the hard work of the teachers in the classroom and um, how well they're conveying um, what it is um, that uh, they want these kids to get out of the courses that they're offering. And I'd like to add on to that where the amount of content knowledge and the skill that I, I'm very fortunate to have with my department. And I think it's, it makes my job so much more enjoyable. And it's, it's amazing to walk into the classrooms and see what these students are doing day in and day out at a variety of different grade levels. And they can articulate that. Yes. And, and, and they know, can explain it to me when I go in. Right, absolutely. <laughs> and I, you know, again, I want to go back to certainly um, all the students that we heard here tonight did a phenomenal job. But really, um, the kids at town meeting were just so impressive. Yes. Um, they really were. Um, whether you were in favor of the warrant or against it, you could not deny that they presented a very compelling case mm -hmm. and um, were uh, very articulate and very uh, knowledgeable in their presentation. So um, I think that's a real uh, testament to the preparation um, of the uh, club advisor yep. um, and also the teacher in environmental. So thank you for that. And I'd like to add speech and debate. Quite a few of them were <laughs> students from speech and debate, and they did an excellent job with that. But um, can I ask you one additional question? Of okay. So how you talked about the technology and the uh, level of technology. How, how do, you see the, do you see the difference? What difference do you see and do your teachers see between when we didn't have the one-to-one, -one, let's say with the ninth graders, and now that we do? I would say... It, there's a variety of different ways I could answer that. And I think that you have different levels of where the staff are with the technology and their skills. But I would say that a student can show their learning in so many different ways than they ever have before with mm -hmm. the technology. Uh, I speak to my own students or my own children at home. I mean, they will they'll be more than happy to create a YouTube video to show what they've learned versus stand up in front of a class and do a presentation. Mm -hmm. They will be more likely to say, you know what, I'm, it, they may not want to converse one-on-one -on -one with somebody uh, in that certain day, but they might be able to look at a document digitally and say, I'm not ready right now to speak to somebody, but I am ready to put something with the technology. So it can help facilitate that. And when you facilitate that, you can build the student's confidence. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the other big piece of this, is as they get more confident using the technology, you're going to see that confidence go in through other, not just the science class, but other courses as well. Mm -hmm. So as we continue to use it and as it continues to grow, I think you're really going to see positive benefits with it. And just one more thing, sorry. In, science is exciting, so I'm sorry, but it's going to be a I'm not going to disagree with you. So. Um, <laughs> science is exciting. <laughs> Having two students in the high school as sophomores, two women, two girls, um, and knowing that one has been extremely lucky in her freshman year to take uh, biology with a female teacher with a teacher who really inspired her uh, to continue to like science and to move forward with science. Um, I, I just wonder what we're doing in terms of making sure that um, we make sure our girls, all our students, are exposed to this is science, we should continue with it. It gets harder when it gets to chemistry, it gets whatever, but how are we going to continue with this? Just wondering what you're doing in the program uh, in our entire science department that would foster this 
and continue making sure girls continue and move forward with it? I think it, it, we have to look at things as our vision and our philosophy has to look at every single student, regardless of background, identity, or skill level, can grow and they can appreciate science. And they may not be in a science field or a major when they go beyond here, but to give them a platform and a foundation where they can look at something from a scientific background and understand it because of what we're able to provide them at the secondary level, mm -hmm. we have to look at that practice. Regardless of where they are, we have to be able to help that student move forward no matter what. Great. Absolutely. Hey, anyone else, Don? Uh, so first, I wanted to thank everybody else that came up and spoke with the South Row and all the kids. My favorite meetings, I've been here for four years, my favorite meetings always have kids involved because you're really the reason we're all here doing this. So thank you for coming out and, and speaking. And in terms of uh, Mr. Morris, you should definitely, if you're not on Twitter, I can't really help you, but if you're on Twitter, you should definitely follow him. He posts all kinds of pictures of the science uh, curriculum in action, plus fun scientific facts. Uh, last week I learned on your Twitter that a bee in its lifetime only produces one-tenth of a teaspoon of honey. Yes. Yeah, that was a pretty interesting fact. I didn't like it. I'm going to go back and like it now that, I, <laughs> now that I've used it, but, uh, but thank you for everything. Thank you. Good job, John. Just a couple, uh, the biology MCAS, last year was the first year it was in place, or this year? Last year they had a blend of okay. uh, frameworks. This year is a uh, full computer-based version of the okay. test. And how does that look? Uh, so I talked about Ms. Bonner on the assessment yeah. development committee for grade eight. Yeah. The fortunate work of Ms. Brule at the high school, she's also on that committee yeah. with the state. So once again, I'm able to take that feedback from her along with my info from the state as we look at what does this look like moving forward. So some of the conversations that staff have or questions they might bring up. They might say, well, are they really going to do this? Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Brule can interject right away and say, yes, these are things that we've talked about. These are the expectations. So having that come from someone other than me also enables us to really have a, a better conversation of what we need to do. And what is the state going to do with these results? I mean, is this going to be part of a graduation requirement at, at some point? Is so right now we use our high school biology as a competency determination with MCAS. They do not, and we have our uh, advanced proficient needs improvement or failing is the current uh, different levels of performance under the legacy test. The new test does not have the criteria established yet. That is what the, the state's looking for people involved or stakeholders to come together uh, the week before school starts in August to spend a week uh, looking at this to see what yeah. they'd like to do. It's a perfect time. This is a good night to, for you not to have a voice. I know. <laughs> well, I can still interject. It will still happen. Um, and the other thing, so with the AP Physics C, mm -hmm. what is a pre-course course? Do they have to take AP Physics 1? So with that course, uh, ideally, we have to have some physics background mm, that's for right, it. Yeah. Uh, we have some students who already took calculus who are enrolled in the course. We also have some, some students who are concurrently enrolled in calculus in yeah. the course. Getting the feedback from those two um, groups of students has been interesting because mm. I've had some students say, this gives me a better picture into what I'm learning in calc. It's that application piece. Yeah. Versus students who already took calculus have said, now I see where I can use this in a, in, a pra in a way where I didn't learn this in my physics last year. So there's a lot of dots being connected with how this looks. Other districts who've gone to AP Physics C, same feedback. So it's been a welcome change. Okay. All right, anybody else? Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you very thank much. You very thank much. you very much. Thank you for coming out tonight. Well, thank, you. thank you for the gift. You want to yes. pick your kid? Yes. What's your name on the back? Yeah, I didn't know if you all had like a different one today, but yeah, that's cool. I like it. Chemistry is a hard science. Easy there. Easy, easy, easy. It's a new language. What should you do for a living? It's a new language. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm? I can never speak that well as a kid. I know. I would have been amazing. Speaking yeah. That's what I'm saying. Amazing. Yeah. amazing. Yeah. That one girl, her writing was amazing. Did you hear her like? Yeah, they all did a great job. Yeah, the writing was yeah. 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 comfortable yeah. as a kid. Yeah. Presenting in public. I didn't have that problem. All right, no, Linda has not, because I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving, All right, moving on. Along. Uh, second item on the agenda this evening is just a brief follow-up discussion from our first um, uh, 
multi year strategic planning session we had on October 22nd. Um, just wanted to provide you a couple highlights. I was actually very encouraged with the, um, the turnout that we had that evening. We had over 40 parents come. Um, we had an opportunity to talk about our current uh, plans that were on in place in the district, um, have some kind of focused questions to talk about what people would like to see moving forward. Um, we do have the results of the parent survey in. We're still finalizing those, and we should have those out to you for the next school committee meeting, so we'll be able to um, talk about that a little bit more at our next meeting. We did meet also with the um, uh, teachers union because we want to start to get some staff feedback in the process, and uh, we're going to be putting together a little schedule for uh, November and uh, possibly even into early December of some different focus group meetings that we're going to co-host um, with the staff and the schools. And then we're finalizing a, uh, similar to the parents, if you couldn't come to the um, session, uh, some type of a survey instrument um, to get some feedback from st um, staff as well. And then lastly, we're going to actually ask the uh, two element, um, sorry, the two middle school principals and the high school uh, principals and deans um, to take a look at their student council groups or some student active student groups within their schools um, to host some uh, sessions for us to get some input from kids. Uh, we think they'd be the best to kind of get that input where they're so close to the kids and that they would feel more comfortable uh, obviously talking to us staff that they know. Um, so that is, uh, is ongoing. Um, we did actually just uh, type up and attach for you the, uh, the feedback that we had received from uh, both questions. The first one uh, that talked a little bit about our academic achievement and what um, people would like to see us doing academically in the district. And then uh, the second one dealt with all of our different SEL initiatives. Um, so without going point by point through this, uh, we certainly can discuss anything on here you'd like. Uh, but I just wanted to you know, kind of report this back out to you. Again, at our next meeting, um, you'll have a little bit fuller um, information because you'll have some of this, uh, the results back from the parent survey. And then we can um, provide a little bit of an update after we start to have some of those staff meetings on where we're at with some of the plan development itself. So that when we do get together for the second session in December, we can actually have some draft documents to start sharing with people to be able to get some feedback on. So just wanted to uh, share that with you as a little bit of an update and uh, happy to answer any um, you know questions or I'll be providing feedback as we go. Arts questions. Um, when are we planning to do the meeting in December? Um, it was oh, the, the second tenth. Tuesday. It was the 10th. 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 Which shows do we know? <coughs> tenth. Uh, it's the 10th. 12th, 10th. And 12th, 10th. the 10th. Same we're location. We're still trying location. to finalize the location. Okay. So uh, by the time we meet next, I'll have that information for you. Okay. I'm sorry. Did you say December 10th? It's Tuesday, December 10th. Okay. What do we foresee as a format for that? Similar, yeah. different? Um, what I'm seeing at that point in time is we have this feedback. We'll probably do some debriefing activity on the survey results. Um, so people can actually see what the survey um, entailed. And then I do think that we um, probably should start to flush out some of the different initiatives uh, that might either be tweaked or new initiatives and start to get some feedback from people on those. Okay. Timeline from that point, we want to try to have a draft by? Well, we're trying to have a draft. Um, I forget the exact date off the top of my head, but we wanted to have a draft document after the first of the year. Um, so it was after we come back from the holidays that there would be a draft document. And then uh, throughout the month of January, we can be uh, continuing to fine tune that. Um, the thought process being typically uh, we make a recommended budget at the end of January, our last meeting in January. Um, no, I'm sorry. It's our last meeting in February. So we can spend January actually doing the, um, some of the flushing out of the plan. And then at that second meeting in February is when we do the uh, budget recommendation. And obviously, if there's going to be any budget implications based on the planning, we would want to incorporate that at that time. Okay. Right. Anybody else in terms of that? No, I thought the meeting was good. I mean, the turnout was yeah, it was great. It was yeah, full the turnout house. was great. It was, it was full house, and, and you know, students too. There yeah. was some high yeah. school students. Students, some some people that don't have students in the in the you know, in the schools anymore were also there and. So yeah, it was good. actually a very good mix yeah. of, of people. Yeah. I found out after the fact, I thought it was um, great that we had uh, so many students. I think some of them were doing a project, uh -huh. uh, <laughs> too, that they had to do like a civics component oh, really? um, to either a class or a group that they were associated with. But it was great to be able to, they were our yeah. students, um, so it was great to be able to get them out and to provide some input. Yeah. All right. I think it would be nice if it's possible for the next meeting to specifically uh, reach out to all the different groups at the high school of students and let them know December 10th and if they want to come. For example, 
a class reps, student council. These are all leadership type of um, groups. Uh, just to make sure that they're aware the meeting is happening and they may want to be involved in it. Okay. And you know what, but, but me, excuse me, when we meet next and we have the location finalized, we can talk about that and then we can start talking about um, the distribution of those notices. That would be great. Thank you. Anything else on strategic plan? Great. Next, uh, capital planning. Capital planning, yep, uh, a couple of things for you on, on this particular item. If you recall at our last school committee meeting, um, we talked a little bit about some of the capital projects that were in the pipeline for fiscal 21. We talked about some of the projects that uh, were carryover projects from fiscal uh, 20. Uh, we then took a look at the, um, the outstanding projects of fiscal 21, and this was the um, kind of rank prioritized order that we had um, determined that night in speaking. We had a couple of outstanding issues. Um, one, the we did have the recommendation, which we talked about earlier. Um, the town manager and board of selectmen uh, were recommending on the town meeting warrant that we um, allocate money for the high school parking lot for the front. That was one of the projects we were carrying in 20 that we didn't get to complete that did a pass. Um, so we are very thankful um, for that passing. So we actually uh, can kind of check that off our capital list. I still keep a running record of it, but we don't have that as a um, kind of a standing item any longer. So that was helpful. Um, I think what we're, I'm starting to generate all the different project sheets that will go forward to the capital committee. They're going to start meeting um, in a couple of weeks. I think and it's a week we, after um, next. Yeah, next well, Thursday. Thursday evenings, there's two or three evenings, and then there's a meeting in December where we kind of finalize everything. Um, so this, uh, I think it is, it has been helpful in the past to kind of send that prioritized list to them so they have a sense of where the school committee is prioritizing things. This is that list that I would ultimately recommend you accept. Um, the only thing that has come up uh, aside from this is as we have continued to work with um, DPW, there are a number of different um, uh, projects that fell in the realm of like elevators uh, that either need some repairs or, or work um, at Parker Middle School. It's not an elevator, it's an external lift on the outside of the building, kind of near the TV studio if you're ever down there. Um, that does actually need to be uh, either replaced or, or um, renovated sooner rather than later. Uh, we did get some pricing for that. It comes in a little over $100,000. Um, what I have done is carry that as an item on the fiscal 22 list, not on this particular list here. However, as we're getting quotes for the, um, the renovations to the McCarthy, both the auditorium and that lecture hall, we're thinking there might be some economy because the same vendor is going to be doing the seating for both areas and carpeting and things like that. So if there ends up being um, some economy of scale and savings there when the final quotes come in, I may come back to you and recommend that that um, lift get uh, moved into 21 instead of waiting to 22. But um, that I think we can do after we finalize more of this, uh, this process. And also, even if the capital committee is meeting, if we have some hard numbers in before that final meeting in December, I found them always to be open to, uh, obviously, if a project's going to cost you less, they want to allocate less to it. Um, so we could have that discussion with them at the time. Um, but instead of kind of putting that in now and kind of re-ranking everything, I think it's, it's easy to continue with this list, get our pricing, and then I'll come back to you. And uh, I am carrying that in 22 just so that we don't lose track of it. So just to clarify, that lift goes down into the TV studio, correct? So it would not no, prevent, it's it doesn't? A, well, it's on the outside of the building. Um, I'm thinking about the one on the inside. No, the inside oh. elevator is fine. Okay. Uh, okay. But there's a, you know how the, uh, there's almost like an underground at the yes. school, there's like different levels. There's a level that is um, on the very, well, obviously the ground, uh, that goes up to the level where the TV studio is because that's how you would actually access the elevator to get up into the main building. Okay. So and it's still working. It's just, right. it's just old and aging, mm -hmm. and it, um, you know, it should be replaced um, sooner rather than later. I, I guess my only concern is, is that if it were to break down, would it prevent students from being able to you If know, it were to break move, down, it would have to be fixed. Okay. It, it wouldn't be a situation where you, could, you would leave it alone. Okay, that's because right. Because there were students at access. We would just have to work with um, DPW, reshift some priorities. Obviously, if it broke, you'd have to get it done. This is more of a preventative thing right now, okay. preventative maintenance type thing, because we know it eventually will break. All right, thank so, you. So not having been involved in the capital thing in the past and mm. feeling pretty dumb at the last meeting on that, I decided to take a tour of the elevators. <laughs> and it was kind of interesting to see that at the high school, you actually need a key to have access to the elevator. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I had to start thinking about 
what the implications of that are because this is a pretty large building with one elevator and if you are somebody who has a disability who is not really able to move around this doesn't get you you know it's not a fast move anywhere so um i i totally stand for you know moving the elevators along and looking at all this I've used the one in McCarthy many times, so I knew what that looked like, but I agree with you that that's the one that is the worst. But the one at the high school, the access is not great either. Well, the, the, um, all of our schools only have one elevator. So right, I think but like this one needs, you actually have to have a key in order to access it. You can't just use the elevator when you come in. Right. You'd True. be given a key if you, you needed yeah. access yeah. to it. Yeah. Yeah. So you, will, you will find that in most high schools. Yeah. And it's really just to prevent the kids from riding up and down the elevator all day. And then causing um, mm -hmm. wear. Sorry, but it's true. It's yeah. true. But just <laughs> causing wear. It's true. You know, or yes. happening yeah. in the elevator. Yeah. Exactly. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know. Exactly. But true. I hear what you're saying. Yes. Okay. All right. Looking at our original list that we came up with last week, any other thoughts on it since uh, two weeks have gone by? Any adjustments you'd like to see made? Is everybody comfortable with what we came up with? Yeah. I'm still comfortable. Okay. Mm -hmm. if, uh, if that's the case, I'll entertain a motion to. Sure. Uh, I make a motion to recommend the approval of the capital project priority order for the 2021 capital planning committee. Second. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. Okay. So now the ball's in your court, Jeff. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No pressure. Very well worded, John, as well. Thank you. I wrote it out. <laughs> it's my new thing. Um, Next update for you this evening, uh, Dennis had asked um, for just a little update on the MSBA South Row uh, roof project. So just a very brief memo, just letting you know that we are uh, continuing to work on this. The way the accelerator repairs work is the MSBA themselves um, actually designates who your OPM or owner's project manager on the project is going to be. And they also designate your designer or who's going to do all the different design work for the project. Um, so from the school side, myself and Brian Curley, our director of facilities, have a meeting with him, uh, Tommy Ojacoan, and Gary Prosecchetti, the DPW director, uh, to keep the project moving along. Um, Jacob's project management is going to serve as our own as project manager. Um, so we've met with them. We've executed a contract with them for those services. And then Russo Bar Associates is going to serve as our designer. Um, so we've also met with them. Um, as an aside, uh, the four of us are actually going tomorrow um, to a, a little training on the new accelerator repair uh, regulations and guidelines and the way it's a refresher on the way the ProPay reimbursement works. Um, but we did receive, um, subsequent to me uh, writing this memo, we did receive our reimbursement rate from the uh, state and it is right at about 51%. Um, so we knew it was going to be about a 50% reimbursement. Um, so we have some documents to execute on that, uh, that front. But uh, the way this is working now, I will have a uh, more defined timeline for you within the next meeting or two. But the designer and the OPM at this point will um, work to basically get uh, through what they call the schematic design phase. So it's the initial going out to the roof, kind of taking a look at surfaces, doing any kind of testing that they need. Um, we have to produce a packet to the MSBA board um, in the late December, early January time frame to get on to the February uh, board meeting. And then at the February board meeting, they would actually vote to um, authorize us to get into the construction document phase where you actually finalize your um, bid specifications, you go out to bid, you award your project, and then uh, we're still looking to have this project completed next summer, which everyone seems to think is very reasonable. We really want to get out to bid in February as opposed to waiting to the next board meeting, uh, which is in April, because the uh, time construction gets a little tight and you want to get the best pricing. And uh, we want to be one of the first projects out this winter to line up summit work. Um, so once our um, OPM gives us a hard um, kind of schedule for the project, I can give that to you. But just to let you know, kind of that's what's in the work right now. We're in the schematic design phase and uh, work is progressing. Any questions on that? Okay, great. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, next item this evening is just a little update for you on uh, student enrollment. So we um, every October 1, it's now kind of an automated um, uh, report, but our information gets transmitted to the Department of Education, and they take a look at all the different students that we um, have provided them to make sure that they're not double counted or double reported in other districts, and they then generate um, kind of certified enrollments for us. 
So uh, I, again, this could change by a student to two, but you're not talking major changes uh, as we get into um, the li little bit later in the fall. And then these October 1 numbers, once they are final, is what um, the state uses to calculate the Chapter 70 um, reimbursements. So as you will see um, across the board on the second page, this is a chart that I've used now for a couple of years so that we can kind of go back year over year and take a look at our uh, students. Overall, um, this, this year from last, uh, we're actually up about 60 students um, overall in the district at 5,021. That's about 60 students, uh, K-12, uh, higher than uh, last year. Um, I forget the exact number, but it's in the 60 ball, ballpark. And down below, um, I actually take a, a each of the different um, uh, total enrollments by grade level at each of the schools, and uh, we include the number of uh, home rooms that were operating in the buildings. This uh, ties into the whole class size discussion that we've had in previous meetings. And then you just get an average class size per building. Um, so this is a similar report that you've been used to seeing, and you get the, uh, the elementary and then the middle school uh, numbers generated uh, from this report. Uh, the high school is a little bit different. Um, you've obviously received the draft reports on uh, the student enrollment at the high school. We typically wait till the end of the first quarter uh, once the grades are issued just to kind of finalize who's really in seats in different classes because there is some movement that happens at the beginning of the school year with um, students selecting or, or changing classes. Um, so we'll take a look at the high school numbers separate from this uh, a little bit later on this fall. And these numbers are all important as we start talking about budget priorities for, uh, for upcoming school years. But when you take a look at our numbers, one of the things I pointed out, um, you know, we've made a conscious effort at the uh, lower elementary grades, K1 and 2, um, to really try to have those class sizes um, in the 22 or under range. Uh, when you get to third and fourth grade, um, again, keeping the numbers under 25. Because, again, we don't have district-wide enrollment, we don't have like a centralized enrollment, we don't um, assign students to schools. They go based on where they live. Um, so, you know, you do run into situations where a particular school uh, may have uh, more students at a particular grade level just because of the demographic in that neighborhood and how many students are attending. Where in other school systems, you um, might actually just enroll and actually as a student comes in, you, you balance your um, load and your assignments by school, but we don't do it that way. So you are always going to have a little bit of um, variability from uh, grade level to grade level and school to school uh, because of that. But I think really overall, um, our enrollments are, are um, very good. When you look at the uh, middle school level, again, at McCarthy, um, this is the last year of carrying the, um, the split team. Uh, we'll phase out next year, so you see in eighth grade. We actually do have a high uh, number of students, um, 227. Again, that's where we're still carrying 10 homeroom sections. Um, everyone else you can see across the board is eight. Uh, so the plan would be um, to again phase that out for next year so that both schools will be identical having eight sections in each building and um, our enrollment projections um, support that and still keeping class sizes under 25 at the at the middle school level um, so those are your uh, your figures as of October 1st again I do not think they're going to uh, change if they ever did it's going to be by a student or two and I'd report back to you but um, these are the preliminary numbers that we're using as we're starting to work on budget projections for next year um, and this is the number that I would think that the state would be using as they're making their, uh, their preliminary numbers. The one thing that hit me real big here is you're going to have 70 more freshmen next year than you do this year. So there are 400 children or students in the 8th grade and 329 in the ninth grade? Um, yes, technically on paper now, but all of our students don't go to Chelmsford High School. So, okay, um, so about how many <coughs> on average... Um, I would have to look back at last, the last couple of years' reports. Okay, but we have a, a number of students who attend uh, St. Neshoba Tech. Uh, we have Understood. a number of students who do go to private uh, high schools. Um, charter you, school. Charter schools. Uh, yeah. That's also another transition year for charter schools. I can, um, if you like, um, maybe the next meeting or the first meeting in December by then, Just to make I sure. can give you a little historical um, look. But I'll be honest with you, the numbers at the, um, the high school have actually been going down in recent years. Um, so they, even if all 400 students uh, went to the high school, um, they certainly could be accommodated within the, um, the enrollments at the high school now. With the current staff and everything? Yeah, that, I mean, even if you had 400 going in, that would only be 1,600 students. 
and the high school used to have, you know, um, no, I understand, but the staff has changed too. The staff and level Th that's okay as long as yeah, we can take there's a, look a at reason it. for that, and you know, yeah. if we can see what the average number usually is, I'm I just saw 70 more. Wow, yeah, no, it's um, where did you see 70? Oh, you know, you're seeing 70 more because that's the current ninth grade compared to the current 10th. But again, what I'll show you is last no, year's. No, no, no. The current eighth grade is 400 students. The current ninth grade is 329. The difference between that is about 70 kids. Correct. But what I'm going to show you is the current 329 now, what that number was last exactly. year. Exactly. That's and what I don't know. So I'll, um, I'll email you that, or I'll work on that for you guys. Huh? Yeah, I continue to have concerns about the number of kids in the classrooms at the elementary level, but I think... That being said, one of the realities that we have to face is there's not a lot of space in the elementary schools to add additional classrooms. Right. And I think this is, um, I'm, I'm looking at these numbers, I think, trending up at the elementary level. And, uh, you know, I think this is one of the realities that we have to face and, and maybe something that we need to give some thought to. I know we're waiting from the MSBA, I mean, for approval, but, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen. And I think we have to probably think of a, a contingency plan you know, how to deal with um, the increasing numbers at the elementary school. Yeah, I mean, I think when I, as I look at this, um, even at the elementary school level, I don't see a scenario where you are ever going to have to add more than five sections in any particular school, just given our long-term enrollment projection that NASDAQ did. Um, so that would be exceeding the five. Right. Right now, um, you know, Byam and, um, well, Harrington, basically, with the exception of fourth grade, is operating at five across the board. Byam and Harrington are the same um, shell, so basically those two schools could accommodate five at all grade levels if they had to, because we were able to add the uh, modular buildings on, which added the six classrooms. Right. Um, center does not have that capacity, so um, well, Center has a little bit smaller footprint anyway. Well, um, South Row is, but I'll be honest with you, just I know we don't do a lot by neighborhood, but um, looking at neighborhood demographics from NESNEC, um, I don't see the South Row neighborhood really have a jumping, uh, okay. just based on the housing and the number of students that are coming. I don't see that jumping to the point where um, you'd ever need five sections. South Row would also have a problem if we did that. Right. But um, my bigger concern is center. And again, because of space, we, we put four attached modules in that building. Um, so they were already at a little bit of a lesser footprint, and then they have the two less classes. If you had to go more than the two sections we already have, that could be problematic over there. Yeah, I think I just want to keep that in mind, you know, because I think this is a question that comes yeah, we really up quite do a bit. We pay a lot of attention to this, and when we're doing our planning, right, we do right. look at this. But I know we get questions towards the end of the year about class size, and I think one of the things that we don't adequately enough address is um, the space that we have available to us mm -hmm. uh, to be able to address that issue. So I think that you know this is something that we need to be con continuing to be able to discuss, you know, as we go forward. And there are some other, just even within class size, um, some things to think about, like say at center. Um, you've got some of these rooms, um, you know, 21, 21, 21, 25, 22. Um, but each of our different schools houses different specialized programs. So, like, center school houses a life skills program for us. So those students are kind of baked into these numbers, but they um, spend, similar to, like, the autism program at the Biome, a substantial portion of their day in separate um, classrooms. So they're not really in classrooms, the students during the instructional time. So the the actual number of students is a little bit lower. Um, but when we produce these reports, we're basically trying to match the DOE um, numbers so that someone from the outside, wherever looking at this, they could see where we came up with these numbers. And we're not generating two different reports, a DOE enrollment report and then a district enrollment report, and having to explain why they'd be different. Um, but when parents have expressed a concern about a particular class size, we can kind of dig into it and see how many actual students are in a class and um, are they all there during instructional times and you know what type of um, support levels are in the class as well because oftentimes in those classes you may have a teacher or a para or multiple paras depending on the needs of the students right. what their IEPs may call for um, so it's not just a cut and dry but uh, it is something obviously we have to continue to look at space is a concern and an issue we would have to um, to take into consideration but um, it is something that we look at quite a bit now, have you had a chance to figure out where the 60 kids are coming from or going to? Uh, you mentioned with 60 more kids. Is there any sort of pattern? Is it a little here, a little there? 
a certain um, neighborhood, a certain building project? Uh, no, again, I can break that down a little bit further for you. Um, we literally just got these numbers a right, couple no days I ago. I usually don't do this report until the first meeting in December, but we tried to do it a little earlier for you um, so that you could see the numbers. But it's going to be more at the elementary school level, mm. and I'm just trying to, uh, I mean, obviously we had to do some additions to center, so we know that's a, a school that increased a little bit, and then um, Harrington is the other one. Um, I, you know, we've all been talking about buying and possibly getting an, an uptick, but they really haven't had a lot of more students um, come from the, the developments out in that area. This is more center and Harrington based. I think you raise a good point, though, because we, we have added a lot of uh, uh, development um, in town, and I think that that's important to communicate to the, the planning board around, you know, kind of what our capacity is and, you know, some of our concerns as some of these things come online. I mean, I don't know that it's going to necessarily, you know, change the outcome, but I do think it's important information for them to have as we're going forward about what the impact on the school system is. They can't do a thing about it when it comes to 42B projects. It's against the law to consider, you know, how many um, students will impact the system when you're trying to approve or not approve those developments, so their hands are tied on this. And um, it's very interesting to be the liaison to the Economic Development Council because this, this is part of the discussion quite a bit, um, but there is very little they can do about that, that part of things. But you can clearly see the developments going up and, and the potential for the increase. And looking at these numbers, I know that there were children in and out of the rooms, but I am a, a, a big one for, if we can keep those sizes well under 25, mm -hmm. it, it is so crucial to the child's education, in my opinion. It would be really interesting to go back and see class sizes and the impact on the students in those classes throughout the years. Of course, nobody has time to do mm -hmm. <laughs> who, who's gonna do that, but it does impact children greatly, in my opinion. Yeah, the only thing I could say on housing, um, to your first point, the um, the biggest consideration or concern for me would be knowing about the developments that are coming, and the uh, various town departments are very good about telling us what projects are in the pipeline, you know, what might be coming, because a project doesn't just open up tomorrow right. and all of a sudden kids right. come, um, but they've been very good about that. So I know, like, there was a development out on Mill Road uh, recently. I was able to actually kind of go and take a look at it, and um, I think it's actually uh, not targeted towards a school-age population. Um, but just to kind of know that those things are coming are helpful and, and we are getting that information. We then uh, give that information to NESDEC because they still work with us. Even though they did the full-blown 10-year enrollment projection, they update their figures every year. They go back and take a look at birth rates and uh, because everything was based on a projection. So what actually happened, um, they take into con um, consideration the different um, developments that have been licensed for construction, what phase they're at, to just kind of predict for us um, where the enrollment is. Mm -hmm. And we really do every couple of months uh, take a look at it just to make sure we're on target. I'm glad to hear that there's that level of collaboration and information sharing. I was actually less worried about what's coming in and making sure that we're doing our due diligence and getting information out to those boards as well. Okay. All right, anything else on enrollment numbers? Okay. All right. Uh, student activity account audit reports. Yep, you have um, uh, two reports before you this evening. We've talked in the past a little bit about um, our student activity accounts. We have three in the school district right now, so each of our middle schools has a student activity account, and the high school has a student activity account. Do, do you want me to talk about this, or do you want to? Okay. And um, so we have three accounts. Uh, at this point in time, they're all managed um, through Joanna's office and the business office. Um, so we've kind of taken the burden off of the schools from doing all the rec record keeping and reporting and whatnot. Um, we're on a cycle now where your student activity accounts, if you have over a certain amount of uh, funding in them, are required to have an audit, an external audit performed every three years. We decided it would actually be uh, just easiest and best for scheduling purposes to conduct an audit every year, but to rotate. Um, so one year we're going to audit the high school, which we did two years ago. This past year was an audit of the, the two middle schools. This year we're in, we're in cycle to do the high school again. So we're going to do an audit with Powers and Sullivan every year of one of the two levels. And that way we'll never fall beyond the, uh, the three-year uh, look back. But um, the, we, we do have the final audit reports in from, uh, from both groups. Again, one is specific to Parker, one is specific to McCarthy, and uh, I don't know if there's anything particularly you'd like to um, say on them. Um, you know, from our standpoint, it's, it's to convey this information to the school committee, letting you know we're having this done, and then um, more of a regulatory type thing. 
I did just want to thank uh, my staff as well as each principal and their school secretary um, for all their work on these accounts and uh, helping us while the record keeping is in our shop here uh, we do reach out to them uh, and it's it all starts at, at the grassroots level the uh, town accounting and treasurer's office also is a great help to us um, we get the bank statements on time um, if we have any difficulties they're very um, much um, appreciated and available and are um, been very supportive of, of us and just avail available for any questions on uh, you've seen these reports the financial reports quarterly uh, but now you can see the the full audit from the the external auditors perspective um, just out of curiosity uh, some of the issues that were found in the procedural piece of this I mean uh, is there a plan in place are we going to be briefed on kind of what so some of the things that I'm reading here are just you know um, we were over the authorized amount from what the school committee voted there was a couple other things like that are we putting changes in place uh, we have in when we brought it back in to the central office in the fall of last year okay. um, things changed um, tightened up a little bit um, where we can still keep the levels it's what you're pointing to is uh, important what amount we should keep in the checking account so and we were the checking account was getting uh, too high because people weren't cashing the checks so we really watch that monthly and don't do the transfer from savings to checking as often as we'd like but too bad um, we have to keep that checking account balance where you guys um, voted it, which is a you increased it to twenty thousand. So um, we're just in a better place to watch that monthly more so than in years past when that was um, at uh, the school level. And they did note that they said that since it's come back to the central office, it's improved. So yeah, I think I think both teams can support each other more now uh, to to watch things. Just on that one, I think the um, I agree with what Joanna's saying. That was more of like a timing issue uh, sure. type thing where the um, schools you, you, again you have to think about it. there's a savings account and then there's a checking account. We only have the ability to write checks out of the checking account, and the town holds on to the savings account as a check and balance for us. And what was happening is, the let's say there was $1,000 in the account. If the school would actually process um, you know, $1,000 worth of checks, the checks would be out the door. They would then put a request in to have money transferred from the savings account to the um, checking account. Um, technically, again, looking at this, some of the checks you know didn't cash even though they get sent to the vendor there's a lag time between they get when they get sent out when they get cashed and for a period of time there was too much money sitting in the checking account um, technically because the check hadn't been cashed but the school wouldn't think of that the school would think of you know I've written the check for a hundred dollars it's kind of off my books at this point um, but again I think um, Joanna's group in the business office yeah. um, just can they have not more time but they're just more uh, used to you know checking on you know bank statements and you can check when something actually cleared what a cash balance is and uh, it's just more of a business function as opposed to a school function so it's helpful to the schools to take that in so that was just an example of like a timing issue that they identified and um, you know and again I think what they indicated is you know since that's been brought over here that's been a um, you know a little tighter system so the last time this was prior to this one was 2010 correct I don't know the last time the middle schools were done, do you? I do not know that. Okay. Um, but I think it was quite a while ago. It was a while ago. Yeah. yeah. So I think that um, I, I'm very happy about this. I think this is something that we've been looking at trying to get a handle on for a very long time. And I think um, your department and you have done a, an excellent job. Um, I think we're definitely moving in the right direction. Um, I'm really happy to be having these audits. I think just think it makes everything more transparent and cleaner. Uh, for people to be able to see, um, you know, where their money is going. So uh, one question I had for you, Jay, I know at one point we were posting fundraising activities that were happening. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we were continuing to do that. And the only reason I asked that was because I think we had talked about this last year, that there was actually very little activity in terms of people looking at the page um, to see, you know, what was happening. Right. 
Um, so are we continuing to do that, or did we stop doing that because the numbers were so low in terms of people accessing that page? There aren't a lot of people looking at it. Okay. Um, we do keep it. We've been doing it um, less frequently. Okay. Um, I know it was updated at the end of last week. Um, every time a new fundraiser goes on, it doesn't get updated. Every couple of weeks or so, um, we try to get it updated, but it was updated as of last week. It, it, it is a little cumbersome to have to do, and I don't know, quite honestly, um, how many people in the public are really looking at it. That's kind of so what I was getting at. Is it worth continuing to do? Yeah, I mean, now. again, I don't know if it's useful to the people who are looking at it or if it's not. I mean, that might be something we'd be able to kind of survey or ask people going down the line. Um, I, I just know that it takes time to put that together, and if people aren't, y you know, using it, right. then I don't want to continue to add work that's, right. you know, it's not being accessed. I think that the point was is so that we could notify people that these fundraisers were happening right. so people could tell which were, like, real and which right. were not real. Um, so, um, but if, if, like I said, if it's not being accessed, then why add to, to the workload of, of right. Joanna's office? Yeah. Could I ask, yeah. how do we know it's, it is or isn't accessed? Um, on the website, you can actually see how many hits you're getting to particular pages. Okay. Like how many, and the how public many times can people see are, that? No, the public can't. Uh, but there's, it's us. there's metrics behind the website that basically just tell you how many times people are visiting. Okay. Not, I don't know who they are, but like how many times they're visiting the site. And it wasn't a site that was getting a lot of activity. Um, so what I would say for the time being is we'll continue doing it because we had. Um, and when we maybe talk about our communication strategies in general, about what people uh -huh. like to see and don't like to see, we could just address it at that point in time. Um, because again, if it's something valuable to a group of people and we all agree it's valuable, we should right. keep doing it. If it's something that's not, then we want to put our resources somewhere else, we should have that discussion too. But I wouldn't want to just yank it without having the discussion. No, I agree. But I, I just you know, well, want to point that out, and I, I just want to keep an eye on that. Yeah. So for all of our website access, we, can, we have metrics. This is great information. <laughs> because you know, just I, I think it would be wonderful to some of, some of the things I think people can't access. They ask me that all the time. We can't find this page or we can't find that. Um, I don't know if this is something that people know it exists, is out there. So I think your, your idea about um, making sure yeah, I that. I mean, there's probably some stuff I can help you with, but there's probably some stuff I can't either. Like if someone right. doesn't go to a page, I can't tell you that they didn't go there, but if if someone did visit our page, I can tell you how many hits we're getting and things like that. Okay. And just to follow up, Adana, you know, it, my reading this report is is you know, it said to me that you know we, we had a couple of loose ends, and we've since tightened them up, and we're heading in the right direction, which right. is good. Um, and I appreciate you did put those new procedures on; they're available now online. So. Yeah, um, Joanna had some. Um, um, grants procedures all the different say club advisors yep. or coaches who utilize the funds would have them but we actually just um, posted them up yep. online so anyone can so see, them. Want to see it's, what it's not a private document okay. so. so this is the middle schools what happens at the high school for activities same so they have they have a very large student activity fund and um, is that separately audited how does it, that work yep no I just uh, mentioned that so okay. what we do is the two middle schools one year and then the next year we do the high school. So okay. this is the year that we'll do the high school. Oh. We did the high school two years ago. So we're gonna get, even though you only have to do it once every three years, we're gonna do an audit a year. So we'll do like middle school, high school, middle school, high school, and then we'll never fall beyond the three and uh, we'll keep up on that. So this year is high school? This year is high school. And what they'll typically do, correct me if I'm wrong, is when they come out in January, February to do our end of the year report audit, which is like our uh, financial report to the DOE based on June 30th, they'll do the student activity audit at the same time. So you'll get the report um, hopefully sometime late spring, summer, depending on scheduling. This one took a little bit longer. Okay, thank you. But we'll be in that cycle wherever you would do one. I think we just had a report on student activity fees at the high school, uh, all the clubs and activities and their balance. We, we did that last year. Spring. Yeah. No, I didn't we just get a report a couple of weeks ago? Well, well you, you know, As Joanna always gives you her balances. Okay, yes, that's what I was talking about. Oh, every about. quarter yes. you okay. get the yes. report. Yes. It's the audit. Okay, yes, so that's what I meant. But we did just get a report on that. Yeah. Yep, Joanna every quarter gives you, the, um, mm -hmm. gives you the report. We okay. use QuickBooks, so you get the report from QuickBooks. It's just externally audited right. every um, other year. Thank you. Okay. All right, anything else on the audit report? Um, just to that point, too, not to belabor this, um, <laughs> all of our historical audit reports are online, so we'll add up these two uh, by the end of the week. But you can go and even look at the last high school audit. It's uh, it's online. Uh, we don't need to take any action on this? 
You don't. I mean, you just, if you wanted to take a motion to just receive the reports or acknowledge the reports, but um, there's no action you're really taking. I'm just conveying them to you. So, right. it's okay. Do you um, want uh, make a motion? Just to accept the reports and place them on file? I make a motion to accept the Powers and Sullivan audit report and place it in file. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> Delayed aye. All right, last thing, uh, approval of conferences and field trips. Yep, you just have two, um, two field trip requests before you this evening. Um, the first is for uh, Parker Middle School seventh grade students um, to go to a performance of A Christmas Carol up in Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, I did not write the date of the field trip. Hang on. It is on uh, December 13th. Um, and then secondly, the Chelmsford High School um, students who are in French uh, 3 and 4 um, to participate in a weekend exchange program with uh, students from Quebec, Canada. And our piece of the exchange would happen on May 22nd and to 24th, that particular weekend. And then the Quebec kids come down here? I think they come. The f this is a new thing. So I, the kids are going to come to us first. So the weekend prior must line it's up kind with, of their, like, long with their vacation. Yeah. So they'll come to us. Um, so we don't need permission for that because it's them coming here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then it's when our kids go the following weekend up to Canada. I just think it's kind of cool. It yeah. is cool. Yeah. 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 It's the first step in yeah. a kind of an exchange program. Okay. Even though I'm not allowed to the talk middle to school me. trip or are they still do the they middle school do trip? They don't do that anymore. Uh, it's it's going to be dependent on whether the schools decided to do one or not. So this is my understanding. I'll just and you follow up on because so last a couple of years ago. Um, there was a change. Quebec was not a trip for McCarthy anymore for the middle schoolers. It became New York as an overnight trip. And I believe now at the high school, um, Madame moved over there. I think she was very interested in this. There seems to be another teacher with it as well that I saw here. Um, and so this is becoming a more extended trip to Quebec with more interaction with actual families there, it appears, but the middle school okay. has not been doing it, to my knowledge. Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. okay. I, am I wrong? I think that no, that no, was. No, no, no. There's just two different trips. Yeah. This is more of that, that exchange, the back and forth, mm -hmm. right. where they were just going on the right, trip right, right. and right. getting the cultural it was experience. It like an eighth grade yeah. trip, yeah. but yep. exchange. Yeah, I remember it. That's why I asked. It was excellent, I, there's though. nothing stopping them from doing it, I no. guess. So if, if the staff and students wanted to do it, it may they come before purposes. you. But um, it's, a, it's a different thing. Yeah, it, when it happened at McCarthy, people loved it. The students who went had a great experience. Yeah, I'm excited to see this one because we don't typically see the students coming from another country. So uh, this will be fun. To come uh, to Johnson High School and go to yeah. classes and stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're going to do that. How many students are we talking? Um, they're hoping to get like, you know, 40. 40? 40-ish. 40 40 Yes. Right. So, and the key is too, like if, if um, because oftentimes, we, like if we're sending kids out, um, we also want our families to take kids in. Right, right. Um, so it'll be it'll be interesting. We'll see how this goes. Mm -hmm. I make do are you good? Uh, I make a motion to approve the two field trips as presented. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero. Right. Okay. Uh, any liaison reports? Yes. Um, so the South Row um, Elementary School just held their pumpkin fair, um, which was a tremendous success. I think it was a record year in terms of fundraising for them, um, and uh, they sold hundreds and hundreds of pounds of pumpkins. Um, they have a movie night coming up. It's just for the South Row School on the fifteenth. I only mention that because it's just one of the many activities that they have planned, that the PTO has planned um, uh, for the, uh, the kids, and they do just such a nice job. I'm going to put uh, a picture up for you. Oh, thank, oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Linda. It was, um, it was fun. Oh, no. Um, <coughs> the Chelmsford Friends of Music, um, they're, oh, I should say about South Road, there's no meeting in December. Uh, the Chelmsford Friends of Music, they're going to be having their next meeting on November 14th at the police station. Their silent auction is going to be opening up on November 20th and will run to, I think it's December 10th. I put first, but I think it's actually the 10th. So people could look at their Facebook page to get more information about that. You just bid online. 
Um, they also had seven members of the Chelmsford Friends of Music run in the Bay State Half Marathon to ri raise I funds. Saw that, yeah. Yep, uh, for um, CFOM, which was really terrific. And um, their last bottle and can drive will be on uh, November 9th, um, and then they're kind of on a hiatus until March. Um, for CPAC, their next meeting is on November, hang on, 6th um, at uh, Chelmsford High School. Um, one thing I wanted to mention was um, through the hard work of uh, Lori McCarran from the Chelmsford CPAC, as well as Kathy Healy Norton and Alicia um, Curtin Mallon from uh, Westford School Committee and Westford CPAC. Um, they were able to um, have November recognized as uh, CPAC month, and a proclamation was signed by the government, uh, governor, excuse me, governor, um, just last week. Uh, so congratulations to them on all their hard work for that. Um, and CPAC will be having a, an inclusion elementary workshop at the library um, at 7 o'clock, also on the 6th. I'm not sure what I did there. Maybe it's just they're having their... Is it? I'm sorry. No, I'm not sure. Did you say the next CPAC meeting? I thought it was no, the six, but the six? I yeah, got that it's wrong. Tomorrow. Yeah, I know. Tomorrow? I had that in my calendar, but I must be okay. thinking about the inclusion workshop. I'm sorry, CPAC. Um, no, November 26th? No. That's Sixth. a different meeting for them? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I blew that. I'm sorry. But anyways, the most important thing is there's a workshop tomorrow night at the library. So, <laughs> And then uh, Parker Middle had their uh, pumpkins and pizza and they're going to be having their craft fair. Um, it's in the cafeteria there from 8 to 4 on uh, November 23rd, and their next meeting is on November 13th at 7 o'clock at Parker. I had never gone to that event before. That was a lot of fun. Which one? The Parker with the pumpkins. Oh, that's really cool, isn't outside. it? In the yeah, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, they do a nice job. Yeah, they have email. <laughs> <laughs> you have to mute. Okay. Um, okay. Editor? Yeah, I'm sorry, yes. The CHIPS PTO met two weeks ago and they're continuing their con support for staff and setting up educational fund activities for the students. They work very hard throughout the year to provide all of these opportunities and their next meeting is this coming Friday. The high school PTO met last night and they I've already started working on the after prom breakfast. I don't think people realize how much time and effort oh, goes time. into that. I mean, they're looking at Black Friday going out and starting to buy some of the prizes and the presents that the students will get. Uh, they could use more help. Uh, it's a handful of people who end up doing all the work. And it's an incredible event. I know I was the advisor of class in 1983, and we had the second after prom breakfast ever, and it's, it's a great, great activity for students and even students who don't go to the prom if you're a senior you can go to the after prom breakfast and be with your friends and all and it's a it's a tremendous amount of work but for most of the students it's one of their favorite times of the year and of senior week so they they're starting on that already so that's their their big push now and any parent at the high school would like to volunteer you can get a hold of Chris Lefebvre and the rest of the members and they'd be more than happy to yeah Jeff is smiling at me because last night I also attended the meeting as a parent yeah, and, so got, graded, and got hooked so into doing one thing, right? <laughs> I attended the wellness committee meeting. I was my first uh, presence there. Um, they did update on the pilot program that was presented to us uh, recently and how that's going. Uh, they didn't have a sufficient amount of numbers, so they're going to go back and look at that again. Uh, they need some better numbers. However, they had a pretty good attendance um, at this after-school program. Um, they had questions, a lot of discussion on the amount that's being charged may not be sufficient to have good people participating and running the program. And another discussion that was had was about whether it should remain with um, the community ed and the census of, the consensus seemed to be that it should remain with community ed and that's its right place. So there's going to be continuing discussion in the wellness committee about this. I attended the McCarthy PTO meeting. Uh, Recycle Day was November 2nd. I don't know how well they did, but I'm sure it was good. It usually is. Movie night had 150 students, which was an overall the biggest turnout ever. And they had their Halloween um, costumes and uh, contest. The EL Council made a showing at the um, EL um, Parents Night 
there was quite a good turnout. Very good. Um, mm -hmm. Jay and Linda both came to this meeting as well. Um, quite a few parents. One thing I, I would point out to the committee so you'll know is that parents are looking for EL classes themselves and quite a few left to list to see what's available from our community. Um, now I know that Kelly and I will send out the programs we know in the area. For example, Middlesex Community College offers it. It is for a fee. Um, I don't know. I'm going to reach out to the community services person in the town to see if there's anything offered through Chelmsford. Um, okay, and next week we will put up, send out notices again. Our first meeting of parents will be November 20th at Harrington um, in the evening at 7 o'clock. Uh, Harrington Trick or Treat was a lot of fun. Um, there were well over 25 cars. Um, oh no, you have pictures from that too. I do. That's first place. This was absolutely yeah, amazing. Um, Donna yeah, came right. too. Um, you know, Donna was, was awesome. there as well. It was a terrific event. It was an awesome yeah. time when you looked at that parking lot with all of the little kids in their costume and adults in costumes and people just being, having fun and doing it the right way. It was a really amazing time. For Harrington, this is absolutely great to see. Um, and I was so proud of all the parents who, and the PTO who put so much work into this. And they should really, truly be applauded for that. Um, there was a first, second, and third prize. And OK, first prize went to the Witches movie. Um, uh, Hocus Pocus. Hocus Pocus. Hocus Pocus. They were amazing. Then the second one was the How to Train a Dragon. Yep. No. No, that Harry was the Potter. Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Harry Potter and Harry then Harry How to Train a Dragon was number three. Dragon. Very good. OK, I'm sorry, I attended more meetings. Chicago is coming up 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. I, do, I could not find the link on how to buy tickets. I usually, that link is in the site of the Chelmsford High School. Yeah. I did not see it. So I just don't know if you might want to just check that. But uh, I they're bought my tickets I'll at the football game. Fast, they're yeah. selling fast. It's going to be a great three nights. Um, speech and debate. I went to my first and became a judge. Loved it. It was absolutely amazing, but I could see why some of the students who came to our incredible town meeting and presented did what they did. They learn a lot through this process. And then finally, I'd like to point out band senior night. It was amazing on that football field. First of all, we beat Westford, which was great. Mm -hmm. And second, <laughs> and did a very good job by one point. And then the second thing is that the band was a collaboration with the middle schools. They come to see that band night. And that was amazing to see on that field. And the type of talent that we're developing through these programs was great to see. So that's enough for me. Um, looking forward to next. Uh, just a couple of things for me. So I did attend attend the uh, the council schools with the superintendent and s assistant superintendent, and it mainly was around uh, just about their fundraising. And then the other thing I attended was the uh, the trunk or treat oh, at the Byam School, right. which there may that. have there been. There it is. I knew it was coming. There I may have been it. a friendly wager uh, between the school committee members and the uh, the administration. Um, I will say through some dastardly and some may even say unethical use unethical. of school Ooh. resources. Ooh, be careful what you say. I think I look good in that picture. I, do, I think you look good in that picture too. And uh, I will say Where's that the trunk? next time. Where's our trunk? There's no trunk in that. I, I don't know. When I went over to that trunk, I kept getting candy thrown at me, so it was right very there. I don't know if using the theater guild's fog machine without their permission <laughs> I know I had permission completely disqualified you I no but in, in all seriousness great event all the kids had fun yep. superintendent and um, Dr. Hirsch over there killed it um, although we had great prime spot and we got to hang out with Mr. Fredette all day so I, I don't know there was too much candy being thrown at me so I yeah you had t-shirts it yep. was, uh, I have to say, just on, on that one, we had a lot of fun at the uh, Biome that day. It's been like three weeks of Halloween because yeah. Yeah. the yeah. Biome was the oh, first event. And then uh, center. we had Center, and that was a lot of fun. I thought some of the cars at Center were some of the best um, decked out. How cute um, is that picture? Well, that's another good one of me, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind the kids. No, it uh, <laughs> came out really nice. The, but some of the, the cars were so well decorated. Yeah, they took it they to really another were. level. 
Um, and then Harrington postponed because that particular Sunday it was really rainy, which was really great because then, mm-hmm. yes, about two days ago, um, they had a great time. So, but it was, it was like three weeks of Halloween. Halloween. Um, but it was what a was lot that? of fun. I will say next year you're not getting off that easy. I've already started planning for next year. You have a whole year that? to uh, I have a whole year. Really plan and strategy. You're going to need a bigger bus. It's for the children. It's for the children. <laughs> it's for the children. Yes. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Any uh, new items? Um, Jay, you want to look into EpiPens on the buses? Yes, I was busy with Halloween. I All right, we'll get on that right away. Uh, we're also going to check on the crosswalk at the back of South Row. Right? Yes. And then um, we had also talked about looking at the PTO pages on our district website because some of them really haven't been updated in quite a long time, if they're even there. The PTO ones? Yeah, PTO pages on our site. Um, I think that, that would be, I know that getting people to the meetings and getting volunteers is tough. Um, and these people put in a lot of work, so maybe if we get those pages updated, it might help just p- keep people apprised of you know what the events are and when the meetings are and stuff. And then the other thing I want to mention is I know we had a power outage at Byam. Mm-hmm. Um, was it last week? Yeah. Last week? Last week. Um, and I know that one of the issues was there's no power. So there there's no windows in the bathrooms. I mean, if you're in a classroom, you can you may have you know access to sunlight. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in the bathrooms, I didn't know if we had a plan like for you know, what do we do for these four kids, you know? To be honest with you, we actually uh, luck out at the, at the buy-in because the uh, bathrooms do have lights. Okay. So uh, that particular morning, so this, this does happen, unfortunately, from time to time. That particular morning, um, there were a couple of different power outages within town based on trees being down and things like that. Um, buy-in, South Row were down early on. And then I want to say around 6 o'clock or so um, started to come up. So we, made, we have to make the decision. So we made the decision to have school. At that point, um, two out of three of the zones that buy them were working. Um, one zone was down, but the emergency generators were on and uh, basically powering all the life safety systems in the school. Um, between that time when we have to make the call, we're going to have school. In 9 o'clock or so, um, another branch or something fell uh, out in the back of Byam, kind of in the woods, um, that actually took out power to the entire school. So we went from two-thirds power down to nothing, where we thought we were going to have full power. So we went forward with the day. Even though uh, we lost power in the school, the backup generator um, kicks on and runs all of the, um, again, life safety type lights, um, some random lights within hallways. Um, but the bathrooms actually are wired into the system, so the bathroom lighting is on. Okay. So when you're in the bathrooms, because again, there are no windows, um, they have lights. Um, so, and I saw them, I went over there that day and took a look at things. Um, so the bathrooms were not a problem. If anything, um, classrooms were fine as well. The building was warm. Um, as long as you opened your shades, you had pretty good lighting. Um, cafeteria was great. Gym was a good area. Um, so we really didn't have significant issues during the, um, during the day. Um, we did, uh, building inspector was over there as well, um, DPW. We did talk about the one darker area that we would have liked to have seen a little brighter was the hallways. Um, so the, we're trying to have every couple of lights be powered on to the generator. So um, it's not however many it is now, just to have a little bit better light but it was isolated to the hallways. And then I want to say by 11.30 uh, that morning, the school was fully back on yeah. regular power, um, so it was okay. We do get calls, and I didn't actually ironically get any calls for that storm, but we do get calls once in a while from parents about, you know, do you dismiss, um, whatnot. Typically, I will tell you, unless it is a um, some type of a significant emergency, um, you're not going to dismiss particularly the elementary schools once school starts. So if we make the decision to have school, we're typically there for the day unless something catastrophic happened during the day. Um, we can't send elementary school kids home without knowing that there's someone at the bus stop waiting for them or someone home to take them. Communication with 500 kids during the school day is very difficult as far as reaching parents and letting them know. Um, even trying to reroute buses during the middle of the day, again, if it was a true emergency, that's one thing. But um, this type of a situation you wouldn't so oftentimes by you know five o'clock in the morning we need to make a decision whether we're going to have school or not and we made the decision that day um, based on the information we had and the fact that we felt the school was powering back up on and the fact that the generators were running and uh, things just didn't go our way after uh, obviously we made that decision made the best of it Um, it was um, off-putting for a couple of hours the kids were actually wonderful Um, staff were great too and um, again School is fully powered by 11:30, but um, that's the, so the bathrooms are fine. But we actually found out by doing that we want to add a little extra lighting in the hallways, and I think that's the one area that um, we could have benefited from some extra lighting. Okay. Any other 
Any other new items? Uh, just wanted to point out, and, and hopefully everybody got the email, uh, tri board meeting on mm -hmm. the 9th. December 9th, everybody good with that? We'll be mm -hmm. here, I assume. Yeah, we typically hold it down here in this building. 7 o'clock? 7. 7 o'clock, okay. All right, so just want to make sure everybody got that message. All right, uh, we're now to our second public comment section of our meeting. If anyone would like to come up and ask any other questions or have any other comments, uh, please feel free to come forward and state your name yep. and address. I'm Wendy Miller, um, 11 Pleasant Ave, Chelmsford, and I just want to address something that came up earlier about the Quebec trip <coughs> at McCarthy, that um, this past year in May, um, Mr. Cantor did the Quebec trip. So the McCarthy oh, eighth graders that. went to Quebec, maybe it was the end of, end of April, it, but they went there and they had the opportunity to go to New York as well. That's right. So that's, mm -hmm. so that even though you know, he, he felt comfortable in his second year of teaching French at McCarthy to resurrect that trip again. So that's all I wanted to say. You see what happens when you leave for one year? I know. You're out <laughs> of the you, loop. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate you thank you. that. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. All right. So uh, we are now at this point uh, going to adjourn to executive session uh, to discuss recent contract negotiations. So I'll entertain a motion to adjourn and not return. I make, sh make a motion to adjourn into ex executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation without returning to open session. Second. Okay. John? Uh, aye. Maria? Aye. Sorry. Jeff? Aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Okay. I'm not used to right. going first. Regular <laughs> meeting is adjourned. We'll take a couple minutes. And then